if you're stuck and you want to become unstuck and make progress, go master a new skill set to the point where you can write a book on it, the point where you can provide that service or skill set to other people as a service provider. At that point, you can open so many doors, but as long as you keep reading about that and not doing it, you're going to stay where you're at. Second piece of advice would be to really master your emotions when it comes to money. Once you can do that, the world's your oyster. You can do anything. Because you can apply that skill set to absolutely anything in any industry that inspires you. And that's really the key to, to success these days. The moment you take your eye off the product and the end use customer and how much they're enjoying it, get out of the business because it's going to kick you out. I believe that the fast lane to financial freedom is to build a business and invest the profits. And if I were to say the faster-ish lane would be to build a business and sell it and automatically placing that into some sort of a long-term investment. Okay. So for me, that's just I have E-Trade deduct a certain amount from my checking account every month and I go and I put that into dividend paying stock. Money Revealed is an exclusive video series where self-made millionaires share their secrets on how they got rich. In this episode, you'll learn how to make investing easy, the key skills for success in any industry, and why you need to serve first if you want to get rich. These are the lessons that they don't teach you in school about making money. And we've partnered with the series creator Jeff Hayes to bring it to you on my YouTube channel. Enjoy. I'm a great admirer of Mike Dillard. I've read his newsletters for a long time, and he's someone who is greatly admired in the entrepreneurial world. We were excited to go to Austin to sit down with him and gain insight and wisdom from him. And he's just got a style and a delivery and a way of communication that is extremely powerful and compelling, but also it's just no hype. What you see is what you get. There's great insight here, and it's something that I'm very excited to bring to you. Enjoy my interview with Mike Gillard. Mike, you have such a great reputation. I've really been looking forward to this conversation. So uh, thanks for making the time. Yeah, absolutely. I'm looking forward to it. So let's talk about uh, maybe just your entrepreneurial journey and background. How'd you get started in being an entrepreneur? Oh gosh, that goes back to my days in high school mm -hmm. and waiting tables at the original Macaroni Grill in oh, Burlington, wow. Texas. Yeah, uh -huh. just the same building as the original Rudy's Barbecue. And I used to mountain bike race competitively and I needed money to fund that, so I'd, I'd bus tables uh, at night during school. Mm -hmm. And I really earned an appreciation for the lack of freedom that comes with having a job. <laughs> yeah. And the fact that I'd miss out on a lot of good times with, with friends on the weekends. And I'd come home at you know, 11, 12, 1 o'clock in the morning, exhausted, smelling like food, and would head back home to my parents' house, turn on the television uh, that late at night, and there's really only one thing on at 1 a.m. back in those days, which was infomercials. Uh -huh. <laughs> so watching Tony Robbins and Carlton Sheets and all of those guys, and that really just exposed me to the fact that there was other options available and options without limitations, which really appealed to me. So it was a natural fit, but that was the inspiration and started playing with uh, you know, starting little businesses way back in high school and college, and that's where I got my start. What did you study in college? Uh, <laughs> first semester was biology. Yeah. I was going to be a dentist because at the time my uncle was the most successful, wealthiest person in our family tree. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, if I have no other, other interests, that seems like the smartest thing to do. Uh, immediately found out what beer was <laughs> <laughs> when I showed up to the dorm because I never drank in high school since I was cycling. And my first semester I got a 1-3. Um, so immediately changed, changed plans and I went to summer school on probation, switched over to marketing and did well there, but uh, I honestly never went to class. I went to Barnes and Noble and I'd sit in the business section reading books on the floor, skipped all of my classes and then I would go pay 50, 60 bucks to go to the cram sessions, you know, three days before you get all the old tests. Great. And that's what I did for five years until I passed with a 2.0. <laughs> and uh, my theory on that was that I went to class as much as I need to and not a minute more. Yeah. Uh, so I already knew I wanted to, to be an entrepreneur, so the degree for me was yeah, kind of pointless. So. What did you do when you got out? So what was your first business venture? First business venture was in the network marketing industry. Mm -hmm. And this is Web 1.0 days. This is early 2000s, 2000, 2001. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, at the time, this is pre-social media, no YouTube, Facebook, pre-MySpace. 
Uh, but I had a mentor that had been working with me over the phone for about a year, named Stu, out in California. And I said, Stu, I'm packing up my truck after I graduate a week later, and I'm coming to learn from you until I figure this out. And how did you was, find Stu? I mean, how did he come into your life? Uh, probably through the network marketing business mm -hmm. I was in at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's what I did. I packed up my old Chevy truck with everything I owned from my dorm, said goodbye to the folks, drove to California, got to San Diego where he was, and realized I could not afford anywhere in San Diego, so I kept going to Temecula. Mm -hmm. Found a $300 a month apartment, uh, had my bed, my desk, and a chair, and that was it. And the living room was full of boxes from my, my memorabilia and college stuff. And that was September 10th, 2001. Mm -hmm. So the next morning, wow. I got a phone call from mom, freaking out. And that was, uh, that was a big change in plans because at the time, if you're selling opportunity, if you're selling hope, if you're selling a brighter, better future, and all of a sudden the world changes overnight, that's not really something that people are in the mood to, to talk about at the moment. And so our, our plans at, at that time really took a dive, got a job at Best Buy selling computers there in Temecula for probably three, four months. Couldn't pay the bills at seven bucks an hour, eight bucks an hour, whatever I was making, and eventually headed back home to, to Texas. And it was a, a tough lesson learned, but, but interesting timing. And, yeah, so that was the first. Uh, that was the first venture. So uh, maybe just as a uh, now with the uh, reflective wisdom after being through this, the the role of a mentor in the development of being an entrepreneur and the in the role of timing where things happen because you're also mm -hmm. on the heels of the dot com bubble burst, right? Mm -hmm. So that that kind of process then nine eleven happened. So you know how how timing might influence your plans. Timing is interesting because it can. It can throw a wrench in a certain set of plans and it can create opportunities in different ways if you have the skill sets to capitalize on that. And at the time, I didn't have any skills. I was still trying to figure it out. So I don't think at the end of the day, it would have made a difference either way because mm -hmm. uh, I just didn't know what I was doing. Mm -hmm. But it was, I think the determination was the biggest piece of the puzzle. And I really made up my mind at that point that I was going to become an entrepreneur, I was basically going to die trying. Uh, you know, I'd planned when I couldn't make rent or pay my cell phone bill one month, I was like, okay, I can get a gym membership, I can take a shower there, maybe I can find an air-conditioned rental unit, and I'll sleep there, and then I'll figure it out. And that's where my thinking was going. There wasn't any plan B or, you know, idea of quitting, so. So what's interesting is that um, a lot of people might have reacted in that circumstance by saying, uh, well, I guess I'm not meant to do this, you know, the way things unfolded, which mm -hmm. you know, the meant to be thing is, I always find that to be a confusing premise. But, uh, but in, in your case, it was like there was, you weren't dissuaded, you know, by the circumstances you were still going to work to go through them. What do you think the compulsion was? I mean, because this is really the heart of an entrepreneur, isn't it? The idea of having a job and giving up on everything I wanted to do in life was infinitely more painful than living in a storage unit. Yeah. Yeah. That was yeah, it. That was it. Just that simple. Yeah. So then what unfolded from there? Gosh, moved back to San Antonio, got a job uh, briefly in Dallas recruiting surgeons. This, the biggest piece of advice I ever got was a mentor in that industry at the time. And I'd gone on for five years and failed, didn't make a dime for five years in a row. And it got to a point where I was like, okay, something's got to change here. And he finally gave me a really good piece of honest advice. And he said, Mike, the reason you're not hitting your financial goals in this industry is because you're not capable of getting the result that you want. You're not that person right now. And you've been chasing these opportunities, if you will. And I put all the responsibility for success on something outside of myself. Mm -hmm. Either it was the business or the product or the marketing materials, but I thought success was going to come as a result of those things. Mm -hmm. And it finally dawned on me when he said that. He said, if you want to go make, let's say, $50,000 a month, because that was my big lifelong dream at the time, mm -hmm. he's like, you have to become a person who's capable of achieving that. And he's like, you're not mm -hmm. right now. You're not. You don't have any mastery of any skill sets whatsoever. And I was like, ah, oh, okay. And it was a big light bulb moment for me. So from that point forward, I dove in headfirst into every book I could find on sales, marketing, lead generation and copywriting specifically. I was very shy at the time. I hated talking to people in person and selling. It was just the scariest thing in the world for me to do, even over the, even over the phone. Right. 
So I learned how to sell via writing, mm -hmm. via copywriting, and it took me about a year, year and a half of just going into every course I could, and I'd sit down at night uh, and print out successful you know, sales presentations and letters from some of the greats like Dan Kennedy or David Ogilvy and, and guys like that, and I would just rewrite them out by hand, and I did that every night for a year, about a year. And I learned that skill set, and all of a sudden, I was like, man, I can really sell something here. Mm -hmm. And then I taught myself how to use Google AdWords, and now how do I get eyeballs in front of what I've written? Mm -hmm. And that really changed everything. Uh, I applied that skill to my network marketing business at the time, started recruiting people for the first time ever, built a team pretty quickly of about three or 400 people, mm -hmm. and realized I absolutely hated it. <laughs> <laughs> um, this was like five, six years of pursuing this dream, and I finally have it, and I figured it out, and it was miserable. Mm -hmm. uh, it just wasn't a part of my personality being a really introverted person. Right. So that was another big chapter where it's a um, decision point. Do I give up on this dream of building a business in that industry for six, seven years now, or, or do I stick with it? And the solution or the answer that I came up with was, what if I could build this business in a way that I really enjoyed? Mm -hmm. And for me, the answer was that, to that was just, how do I get people to call me instead? Mm -hmm. How do I stop chasing people and how do I get them to, to come after me? And there was just a little twist, you know, at the time to doing that, which is providing value. Mm -hmm. If you put out value into the world, surprise, surprise, you help other people, they want to work with you. And, and essentially, there's this whole attraction marketing philosophy that uh, I happened to introduce to that industry at the time, so this was 2004, 2005. And no one in that world had ever heard of that. Mm -hmm. They'd never heard of online lead generation, they'd never heard of building a business online, they'd never heard of attraction marketing. And I ended up writing this little 50-page training manual for my team at the time that kind of talked about those philosophies and strategies. And all of a sudden I had phone calls from people all over the world saying, hey, can I sell this manual to my team? Can you make one for our team? So I ended up selling it for 40 bucks a copy online. I'd go down to Kinko's, I'd have 300 printed at a time, little cheap spiral bind binding for two, three bucks a piece. Put up a, a sales letter for it, put it on Google, and within, I think, three or four months, I was selling around $50,000 a month worth oh, of that yeah. book. And that was an even bigger shift, because mm -hmm. now I really felt like I was pursuing my talent and what I was good at, which was teaching. And I'd really discovered that. And so that really turned into an education company where we took the skills, which were brand new of online marketing, and taught it to that industry. And that turned into an eight-figure business, so. Wow, so uh, it's interesting because it seems like, and maybe this is an important foundation for an entrepreneur, is they have to know themselves uh, mm -hmm. really well to be able to kind of keep moving forward where you said, geez, I got what I wanted and I ended up hating it. So you had, you had to learn things about yourself. Well, in the beginning, you're just like, tell me what to do. Mm -hmm. You know, put me in coach and I'll do whatever you say. And that's what I did, you know, for those five years. And I was like, okay, this isn't working <laughs> and I'm miserable. <laughs> What's got to change? And, you know, interestingly, and interestingly enough, that industry is built for people who love networking. They are extroverts. They love meeting people, talking to people. And you stick someone like me in there who shrinks in that environment mm -hmm. and then expect to see success. Yeah. It's an uphill battle for sure, so yeah. So if, if uh, someone were to ask you, so what do you do for a living? How would you describe it? You know, previously I've, I've, I've really just considered myself uh, an educator in the fact that I tend to build companies based on my own personal challenges. Mm -hmm. So whatever my biggest challenge in, is in life, I'll go work on the solution and figuring that out for many years until I do, and then I'll teach other people who have that exact same problem, what I learned. Mm -hmm. And that's really been the heart of what I've done for the last 12 years in two different companies. Now we're, you know, with that, I've been challenging myself in, in new ways to, you know, push myself as an entrepreneur in general uh, outside of that realm, which has been an interesting learning experience yeah. as well. So. Yeah. Well, recently you've been uh, writing a lot of uh, great copy because I've been reading it around uh, cryptocurrency. Mm. What, what got you attracted to that? You know, I don't remember exactly what caught my eye, but I found Bitcoin in 2012. Mm -hmm. I bought my first Bitcoin in 2013 on Mount Gox. Mm -hmm. 2012 was a little too sketchy. You'd get on these forums or blogs and 
and it would be send this anonymous person your credit card info and money and they'll send you this Bitcoin back. And at that time, you know, it was probably pennies, fractions of a penny. So unfortunately, I, <laughs> unfortunately my radar went off a little too late, uh, but, or a little too soon, I should say. But, but 2013, I, I set up an account on Mt. Gox and bought 500 Bitcoin and, and just was like, hey, if nothing happens, great. Vegas money. Right. If something does happen, great. And unfortunately, a year later, uh, Mt. Gox got hacked and I lost all my Bitcoin. Oh my goodness, <laughs> so, oh, wow. That's really yeah. unfortunate. Yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I paid attention to the industry a little bit. I think I bought back in when Bitcoin was about $700 in 2015, 2016. I don't remember the exact date. And started to notice what was going on with Ethereum as well when it was about five, six dollars. And, and at that point, I really, started to dive into that industry in a pretty big way. And I saw, I saw what was going to come from that in the next 10, 15 years pretty quickly. So, Was there something about it sort of uh, you know, either spiritually or philosophically that you said, wow, the idea of a non-government controlled currency mm -hmm. intrigues me. Uh, is, is, is that one of the things that brought you there? Yeah, well, yeah for sure. Um, I was buying gold in 26, uh, 20, 2006, 2007 buying silver, you know, when it was $7, uh, saw the writing on the wall with the financial collapse. And, and for anyone who was studying economics and finance at that time, we should have seen the entire thing collapse. Right. And it took trillions of dollars in money printing to, you know, prop it up and keep it alive. So I've always had a, a bit of distrust around people in power who have control over an unlimited bank account or a credit card and you know we're the ones who end up paying the bill so yeah yeah so now uh, what is your now that you've seen all the things unfold and it, things continue to unfold it's a fascinating mm -hmm. world the whole cryptocurrency and blockchain world uh, what do you see moving forward what do you think is going to happen you know it's really interesting there's two there's two sides of it there's the, the truly decentralized uh, currencies like Bitcoin that basically cannot be controlled mm -hmm. and the real evangelists, the maximalists, if you will, of that world think that that's going to take over the world and become the de facto global currency. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. That'll require mass adoption. So what I've been most interested in following is how our government, specifically the U.S., going to react. Because right. you're not going to see mass adoption if they come out like China did and say crypto and Bitcoin's illegal. Right. You'll get pirates and rebels who will use it, but if you can't buy Starbucks with it, right. it's not gonna reach that point. So following what the SEC's done and the policies that they've put out over the last year specifically, uh, they're looking to blend the two. Mm -hmm. And I don't know exactly how that's gonna work out, um, but the genie's out of the bottle at this point. What really excites me the most, I guess is the, the tokenization of securities and, and real physical assets. I think that's where the real revolution is going to take place here in the coming years when anyone can take their business or a house and tokenize the value and pull out the equity. You know, that's going to be game changing. Walk through what that means. So you have a house, you got equity in it. What would it mean to tokenize it? Well, at this point, if you want to essentially raise money, mm -hmm. You, for your business, let's say, your, your biggest option outside of taking you know, private funding is to take it public, right. which is basically impossible these days unless you're a billion dollar company, right? So uh, that door has been closed and now essentially you're going to be able to take any real asset you have, again, your business, your gas station, your home, your bed and breakfast, whatever it may be, divide it up uh, into shares assign those to a token and then share those on an exchange or let people buy them, invest in them. You can take quarterly profits and automatically distribute those based on a per token basis to everybody's wallet who owns it. And it can be as fast and as simple as that. So basically the token becomes your, your stock or your equity mm -hmm. that you're selling into a public marketplace that people can invest in. Yeah. And now you're, you're, you're starting to cite the whole, well, how's the SEC going to look at this? Because mm -hmm. you know, they kind of, you know, there's regulation around securities yeah. and who can offer them and how yeah. they're offered, et cetera. So what's the, uh, the current status of, of that as far as the SEC is concerned? You know, I think it's going to be treated very the same way as stock. Anybody can jump on E-Trade and buy stock right now. Mm -hmm. The difference is what, can, what assets can you turn into stock, mm -hmm. basically, and how easily can you do that? And that's really where, where the big change is going to take place. So uh, lots to figure out yet, but 
uh, I think that's going to be that's going to be game changing. Is there an emerging business of uh, people that would say, hey, I'm going to do the picks and shovels of this thing, uh, where I'm going to create the platforms for people to tokenize because, you know, the, the chance person who says, hey, I want to raise some funds and I want to use this vehicle, I mean, you know, what, how, do they, how do they do it? So uh, obviously, you know, the, the trading platforms need to be built. Is, is there a, a yeah, movement we, underfoot we, to do that? One of your, the guests of this, of this movie, Patrick Byrne. Yeah. Yeah, and T-Zero. Yeah. Absolutely. So I've been following T Zero since since he's announced that, and obviously Patrick and I have a lot in common philosophy wise mm -hmm. when it comes to money. So I'm very excited about what they're doing. And uh, what role do you want to play moving forward in all this? You know, the role I've taken right now is to help introduce people to what cryptocurrency is about and how to participate safely. Mm -hmm. At this point, it's still the Wild West. Mm -hmm. I still see friends on Facebook, oh my God, my phone was hacked and my wallet was hacked and my Bitcoin's gone. Wow. And these are smart people. These are entrepreneurs. This is not mom and dad, 70 years old, trying to figure this out. And that's just a huge issue right now. So the role I've taken is, here's what cryptocurrency is, here's what crypto assets are, here's how they work from a layman's perspective, and most importantly, here's how you store them safely and, and transact safely. You know, even you you look at the infrastructure we're dealing with right now and, and outside of Coinbase, you're dealing with my Ether wallet and, and all of these other tools that unless you're an engineer, software engineer, or programmer, you, you're going to have a tough time trying to figure out just how to use it. And so right now I'm trying to serve as the guide around that stuff and, um, and get people involved while the timing's right. So it's still education in essence, yeah, right? So absolutely. now we're just pointing your educational uh, prowess toward this as compared to some of the other things that you've done before. Yeah. You know, it's interesting, as you mentioned that, is that um, I, I got very excited about uh, Bitcoin and crypto when it first came out because mm -hmm. of my own philosophy towards money. And uh, you know, just, I just wanted to morally support it and, and hoped it had a future. Uh, but what you say, and this is why it's a real need. I mean, I come from, you know, my last business was a technology business. Mm -hmm. you know, so I'm not, a, I'm not a tech adverse. I'm really tech, you know, oriented. And when I looked at what it meant to try to purchase Bitcoin, this is back probably when it was trading around $600 or mm -hmm. so, I think. What you're, and I, I said, I'm going to go get some of this, you know, just, just to morally support it. And also, I think mm -hmm. it's a cool thing. And I think it might actually do something. We'll see. But... By the time I really started to look at what does it take to purchase it, you know, what does it take to have a wallet, where are the risks, how do you have to securitize? For me, it seemed so complex and difficult that I said, I can't imagine adoption at this point because, you know, I'm somebody who's kind of tech oriented and, you know, the average Joe is just not going to be able to weather this. As long as you're expecting people to scan QR codes and copy and paste public keys, yeah. you're not going to see it. Right. And you know, one, of the, one of the projects that I follow is all about putting the, the visual layer, if you will, on top of the blockchain. So everything is in the form of you know, a graphical asset, basically, and you don't see the code anymore. If you right. want to send someone an asset, you just swipe it or text them you know, this little digital icon, and that's it. And it's a digital asset at that point. It can't yeah. be copied, duplicated, and you own it. Um, we're going to see an entirely new world of assets represented with these. Might be a can of Coke at uh, you know the store downstairs. Well, I, I have one on my phone. Mm -hmm. Represents a real can of Coke. I can go up to the machine. I can you know make that transfer, and out comes a real can of Coke. And the digital version's gone. And it's going to be really a really neat future here. But we're just now going through the ideation phase of what it could be. So, And I, and I think that's going to be the tipping point when it gets kind of consumer friendly in that yeah. respect of the adoption, I think, will be exponential uh, at that point. Yeah, once, you, once you're using blockchain without knowing that you're using blockchain is when, is when frankly, the opportunity is over. Yeah. Um, so right now, the more complicated it is for people, which is what I tell them, the fact that this is difficult and hard means that there's an opportunity here. So, Well, uh, were you surprised... Um, like when I first was seeing this, that the government stayed passive. Because as you said, the genie's out of the bottle now. I thought the government would try to clamp down on this so quickly because you know, the government control of currency is a you know, major foundation of, of why the government thinks it's, it exists. Right. Um, and then suddenly it, it was out and they were doing nothing. Was that surprising to you? Yes and no. And I've had a lot of conversations with some really smart friends about this because I still don't understand why either. And 
you know, so the global crypto market cap, the entire the entire asset ecosystem around the world is less than $300 billion today. That's around the market cap of Walmart. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't think they're paying attention to it, or at least they weren't initially because it was just small and a, and a fringe application. Mm -hmm. But I also don't think that they could get anything accomplished quick enough anyway. Does anything move fast in Washington? Yeah. It takes years. Right. And this is moving faster than any other technologies developed. Uh, the adoption is moving faster than anything else, and so I don't. Th even if they wanted to, I don't think that they would practically be able to make it happen. And so there have been a lot of smart entrepreneurs like Patrick who've been out essentially lobbying and educating Washington and saying, "Look, this is here. It's not going away. So now we have two options: do we become the center hub of development and innovation as we were for essentially the first internet applications?" Or do we let that go somewhere else to Singapore or South Korea or you know somewhere else? And I think they're smart enough to know we want the brain power and we want the assets here in the U.S. So I think that's the way that it's going to go. Certainly a compelling argument, uh, you know, saying hey, this is out there, and, and now who's going to take the lead? Right. Yeah. Now, what about the wider application of blockchain? You know, beyond you know a, a, a currency, but you know what else it can do in the world? What are you seeing? I, well, beyond a currency and around the tokenization of securities, it really is just, it just comes down to people. And there's going to be two different types of applications. There's a truly decentralized application, which takes people out of the process. And it's, you know, it's funny, I have, I have a, a very smart entrepreneur friend here in town who is not a fan of Bitcoin or blockchain. And, and he's like, I, I just, I know it's going to get hacked. I, I know people, someone's going to come in and, and corrupt it. Mm -hmm. And it just told me that he doesn't really get it because you buy Bitcoin and use crypto because you don't trust people and you don't want people involved <laughs> right. in the process. Right. So, you know, I think the big, the big piece around this is, is Bitcoin is creating a trust-based economy. It's taking inefficiencies that are created in any market by fraud, theft, you know, obfuscation and deceit. Mm -hmm. And it's going to get rid of that. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, the big transformational piece of this. Uh, you look at, from myself as a business owner and using merchant services, and I'm paying three, four percent, you know, merchant fees uh, to Amex and Visa and Mastercard and Stripe and everybody else. And now I can take payments via crypto for a fraction of a penny. Right. Yeah. You know, I'm in. So it's really going to be interesting to see how those companies start to adopt as well. I know, I know, many of them. Visa specifically has been filing dozens and dozens of patents around cryptocurrency and while at the same time you know talking it down and and all of that stuff as well so well they, well smart people what they do they exactly that they're going to hedge their bets on the threat right yeah. you know saying hey this is you know, nonsense and inappropriate but at the same time they're they they've got patents i know that a lot of companies I, well you mentioned walmart i think walmart's got a bunch of patents on crypto if mm -hmm. i'm not mistaken so mm -hmm. uh you know it's been interesting to see how people are scrambling right now to, to try to position themselves for this, uh, because it, it is, it's on a tear that I think, you know, it, it's almost uh, dizzying as far as how fast things are unfolding. Yeah, you know, luckily right now, this is the calm before the storm, post-bubble in 2017, and uh, it's, a, it's a huge opportunity. We're still really, really, really early in this. Uh, I think we're gonna, it's gonna take another five to 10 years before, you know, 80% of the population is using it like their Visa card. So yeah, we're super early still. And you know, so do you think we're you know in another bubble now? And if there was an economic bubble that was gonna burst, what do you think is gonna happen to cryptocurrency when that you know with that? I think the U.S. Is, stock market is entering a bubble for sure. Mm -hmm. When you're hitting all new highs every month, every week, mm -hmm. you're in a bubble. Yeah. And so it's gonna be really interesting to see how crypto reacts when that pops. Mm -hmm. Is that money going to go in Bitcoin, or is it just going to go into cash and stay there? And I don't know the answer to that. Um, you know, I view Bitcoin as digital gold, mm -hmm. as uh, a lot of people do right now. And so, yeah, it's going to be very interesting. And I don't have the answer, but I know I know what I'm betting on. Yeah. yeah. And uh, with with that. Um, do you think? Because you you mentioned Bitcoin. Do you, what about all? I mean, there's. I guess over a thousand or thousands yeah. of yeah. Uh, cryptocurrencies now. 
Uh, do you think the market's over flooded with them and it's oh, going to yeah. be a washout or yeah. what's going to happen there? 95% yeah, of them are gone in a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's great. I think all of the ideas and innovation are necessary. It, it's going to find its, its value in an open marketplace and the winners will stick. But 95% of them will end up just like the dot-com days. Mm -hmm. The question is now, which do you invest in? And unfortunately, just like in the dot-com days, you don't know. So at least my philosophy has been over the last couple of years to put a little bit, a little bit of money in, in all of them, uh, at least the, the top 50 to 100 that, uh, that are out there. And the big piece for me is, is this going to replace an existing market or business or function that exists right now that has a really large user base, is this going to allow that to be done faster, easier, and, and more efficiently? There's a lot of applications out there that are brand new ideas. Let's tokenize the dental records industry. <laughs> maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Put a couple hundred bucks in it, maybe a thousand dollars in it, yeah. Vegas money. Yeah. Uh, but for the most part, I think all of those are going to go away. At the end of the day, a blockchain is a database, uh, and, and the real value of a blockchain is a distributed one, but most of them are not. They're centralized, right. and at that point, you just need a database. Use Google, use Microsoft, uh, you know, SQL, whatever you want. You don't need a blockchain for it that's distributed and, and being used around the world for that functionality. Well, what's interesting um, is that typically if you're like looking to, uh, to invest in equities or even to speculate into markets, there's some fundamentals, you know, well, like if you're going to the dot-com, you know, pre-bubble, mm -hmm. you'd say, okay, well, who are the, who's the team, right. <laughs> right, that, you know, that's doing this, you know, oh, Jeff Bezos, he, well, he's, he's, he's running Amazon, I kind of think he's got his act together, blah, blah. you know, you have certain yeah. things to grab onto to say, I'm going to, I'm going to do this, this research to make my investment here. It's, it's a little bit more abstract, right, as far as, uh, you know, how do I pick which coins? You know, 90% of the the websites I've seen for these applications, and I'm somewhat educated around this space. I'm, you know, on a scale of one to 10, I gave myself a solid four or five, mm -hmm. but I'm not on the engineering side. Mm -hmm. But you go to the website and it's just all of this tech mm -hmm. jargon. And that tells me that they're not in touch with solving a mass consumer problem. They're in touch with building something that they think is really cool. Right. And that's not really an asset that I want to invest in, so. Well. So uh, now if uh, people are out there saying, okay, I'm not a sophisticated investor, um, but uh, you know, I, I kind of do the traditional stuff, uh, but this is interesting to me, what's the path they would take uh, to try to you know, say, okay, I need to get up to speed to be able to properly invest here? Yeah, you know, buying it today is easier than ever. Mm -hmm. uh, there's the Cash App, there's Coinbase, which is super easy. Mm -hmm. and. So I think that's becoming more and more accessible. At this point, it's how do you use it safely? Mm -hmm. So there are just a, you know, a lot of sophisticated scams out there where even if you take some really good security steps and you set up two-factor authentication on your phone, mm -hmm. uh, but if you do it via SMS text, let's say, where you get a text back and you have to enter in your, your code right to verify your, your login, mm -hmm. there are employees at these phone companies that are paid for and bought by the crooks, wow. and they'll switch out your, your SIM card, give your number, you know, control of your phone number to the crook for five, ten minutes in order for them to get that authentication number, switch it back, and you wake up and your crypto's gone. Um, and there's no way to recover it at that point, is no. there? No. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's gone. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, there are just pieces around, around like that that people need to get educated on. We're seeing the big, the big next wave here is going to be with the introduction of essentially, you know, Wall Street uh, institutions into this industry. We're seeing, we're seeing BACT launch this year. Mm -hmm. um, we're seeing the... What is that? Uh, BACT is a joint venture, I believe, between Microsoft and, and a couple of other really large Fortune 500 companies to bring institutional level infrastructure to crypto. Mm -hmm. And a part of that is insurance, mm -hmm. right? So nobody's going to put in pension fund money into anywhere mm -hmm. if it's not going to be insured against theft. Right. And so all of those pieces of infrastructure are being put in place right now this year. And I think once those come online and they get approval from the SEC, that's when you see this turn into dot com. Yeah. 
you know, dot-com days in a really big way. And for me, this industry, and I just tell people straight up, it's speculation. Mm -hmm. We are speculating, we're gambling, and our odds are really, really good. But at the same time, more than anything else, you have to have an exit plan mm -hmm. uh, on what you're going to do with your potential gains. If we see another 100x move, what are you going to do with that money? And I think that's a really important question to ask as well. Uh, and it's just also really important for people to understand that this is unbelievably risky right now. Yeah. It is super early. And so making sure that you don't invest money that you can't afford to lose is a huge, huge part of this. And I think a lot of people unfortunately learned that lesson in 2017. Yeah. You know, so. So uh, for you, um, d do you see yourself focusing mostly in this area for the foreseeable future as far as your business activities? No. Um, you know, the, the focus for me really remains around entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. I think that's my, my biggest point of value in what I can offer people because that's where I've learned the most lessons during my career. Mm -hmm. uh, I think making people aware of crypto and the basics is a role that I can play, but it's not... It's not my field. Um, I, think, I think I have a, a talent for taking complex subjects and communicating them to other people in a simple manner, mm -hmm. which is helpful in, you know, to a large group of people, but that's, that's my role. So, uh, well, let's go back to that for a moment because uh, you, you almost became a dentist, <laughs> or at least right. had an interest early on because, as you said, the, 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 the most wealthy person in your family tree was a dentist. Let's say somebody actually went and did that, and now they've, they've practiced for 25, 30 years, and they said, I can't do another decade or two of this. Uh, I want to become an entrepreneur. You know, I, mm. I, I've saved some money, so I'm not like you know, starving and going to live in a locker, but, you know, uh, but I, I now want to make a move. What do you think, in today's world, the best move is for somebody like that? You know, it comes back to skill sets. Mm -hmm. It comes back to, it's not about your idea. It's not about how much money you can plow into it. Mm -hmm. It's about your skill set. And for me, the primary skill set is on the, the sales side. Mm -hmm. You can have a phenomenal product. You can be a world-class engineer. If you can't sell either your, you know, your backers from an investment standpoint mm -hmm. or your team from a hiring standpoint or at the end of the day, your customers, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. So my biggest piece of advice around that is understand what your skill set is and how that can be applied in a way that'll help grow a business and generate revenue. Revenue is the lifeblood of a business. Mm -hmm. yeah, business gets unbelievably stressful if money's not coming in the door, yeah. especially if you start to build a team and um, you know, your expenses get up there. So that to me is skill set number one. Until you have that, don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. Go learn how to sell, how to, how to market, how to generate leads, how to generate traffic. Once you can do that, the world's your oyster. You can do anything right. because you can apply that skill set to absolutely anything in any industry that inspires you. And that's really the key to, to success these days. And I don't uh, know of a single entrepreneur who has had success without learning that and acquiring that skill set either at one point or another. It really has served as the foundation for all of us. So. Do you have uh, dispositions toward you know, real estate versus buying a franchise versus, uh, you know, trading the market? Uh... You know, one of the biggest lessons that I've learned is when I was young, I always remember asking myself, where's the greatest point of leverage? Mm -hmm. And what would that mean when you say greatest point of leverage? Yeah, where's the greatest point of leverage? Where's my goal? And so back in the network marketing industry, this is what I was thinking about. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, I'm a distributor and I'm building maybe a, a network of people who might consume the products or might sell them as well, but my point of leverage is their activity and their consumption. Mm -hmm. So I might have a group of three or four hundred, five hundred people below me who are buying products or maybe they're building a business as well, but that's my point of leverage off of their activity. Mm -hmm. What's the next level up of leverage? Uh, it's the, uh, the company owner, mm -hmm. right? They're getting paid on everybody's activity and consumption. Mm -hmm. Where's the next point of leverage from there? Well, maybe it's as a software company that is serving all of the network marketing companies. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's providing merchant services to them. Maybe it's providing you know, customer management software, accounting software, whatever it may be. Where's the next point of leverage up from that software company? Well, it's probably the bank who's providing them liquidity and funding, right? Mm -hmm. So same with real estate. If you were going to get into real estate today, if you're starting out, maybe you're going to be an agent mm -hmm. and you're going to go sell homes. And at that point, you're a really hardworking salesperson, but there's no leverage. 
So what's the next level up? Well, maybe you own the brokerage that has 10 agents. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. You look at Keller Williams and you know what they're doing, multi-billion dollar real estate company, I think top three in the world. Mm -hmm. And I've had lunch with Gary a couple of times and, and Gary's in a great point of leverage. He's got 150,000, 200,000 agents underneath him basically making him money every day. Mm -hmm. And so after that, where's the greatest point of leverage? Again, it's the banking system. It's providing the mortgages and the loans for all of these homes that are being sold. So the question that I would ask yourself whenever you're thinking about starting a business, you're not gonna be able to start at that top, at that greatest point of leverage, but what, what is it? And at least think about it. Right. And to me, that would be my goal, uh, is to one day end up there at that point, because that's the difference between making you know, $250,000 a year and $250 million a year. Mm -hmm. Uh, but at least be aware of it and, and look for it. So leverage basically be defined as getting things done through other people. Sure. Yeah, so, uh, and I think that, that was a great stair-stepping example saying, hey, if you're the salesperson, you're, you're hustling all the time and you're just, you eat what you kill. <laughs> yep. uh, as compared to saying, now I got other people hunting for me. Right. And, uh, and they all feed a piece up to, uh, you know, up, upstream. And those are two different skill sets. Making that transition is, has been the hardest one for me to make, and it mm -hmm. typically is for most entrepreneurs. The skills that'll allow you to make your first million dollars, mm -hmm. essentially sales, mm -hmm. is completely different when all of a sudden you can no longer sell and you've got a team of 10, 12 people that now have to take over that role and responsibility. Because you developed a lot of skill and talent and nuance mm -hmm. when it came to producing the results that you did. And all of a sudden, you've got to say, okay, can't do that anymore. I've got to teach these, these other group of people how to take that over. That's a huge transition. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's starting over in many ways for, for an entrepreneur. What, uh, what books uh, or any kind of media have influenced you most that you think you found most beneficial to your life? You know, the traditional think and grow rich, mm -hmm. how to win friends and influence people way back in the day. That's what I was reading in college on the floor at Barnes and & Nobles. <laughs> and... You know, out of, out of, after that, there's a lot of great books from Dan Kennedy on direct response marketing. I think Dan's a great teacher and, and his principles are applicable to any industry. After that, it really has just transitioned into to leverage and, and scaling. From a philosoph philosophical standpoint, obviously Atlas Shrugged. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've, uh, that's been a, a huge inspiration in my life. And it was really interesting, specifically in 2007, 2008, having read that book and watched watching what was happening around the world, it was almost as if it was, like it was a straight out of the pages. <laughs> right. And it's still happening. Yeah. Um, you know, Rocket Fuel is, from a scaling standpoint, a phenomenal little book to help you as an entrepreneur make that transition and get to a point of essentially working on your business instead of in it. Mm -hmm. um, the E-Myth is where that line came from. Yeah. So my home is filled with hundreds of books. I'd say I've probably read half of them. The <laughs> others the others are still on the to-do list. Right. And are you finding you know, that there's uh, a lot of blogs that maybe are beneficial too as compared to just books, but there's other forms of, of content out there that you can go get? You know, interestingly enough, I think that's the biggest challenge young entrepreneurs have today is they're growing up with Instagram and 15 second story videos and five minute videos on YouTube and Twitter and blog posts. And it's more information than ever mm -hmm. with less value than ever. Mm -hmm. And for me, I found that success is in the details. I found that if I will focus on acquiring a piece of knowledge or a skill that I spend a year on mm -hmm. and maybe read five books on or three ring binders on or go to conferences on, and I get down to a level where I'm debating which word I should use out of a document that has 10,000 words because I know that word is gonna make a difference. Mm -hmm. That's the difference between success and not. And I don't think specifically young entrepreneurs these days really understand that. And so they wonder why they're watching hours of content a day and still not accomplishing anything. So for me, I view it as a as a negative in many ways, especially if you're just starting out, you're much better served reading a book that's 200, 300 pages long from end to end. Mm -hmm. You're gonna come out of that with a real set of understanding and skills rather than you know a 10 page blog post. Yeah, yeah and I, I, that's what I've noticed is that depth is important and, and it's, it's that extra little 
few percent of, of knowledge that is the tipping point as yeah. to success versus failure. That's what separates you, you know, as an expert as compared to somebody who's kind of an amateur. Um, success is in the details. Yeah, it really yeah. is. So uh, I'm, a, I'm uh, an admirer of self-made man mm. uh, for a lot of reasons. I think we, you know, we share some of the common roots in our, our philosophies and what's influenced us. And uh, so just the title caught me when I saw Self-Made Man. I mm -hmm. actually own that, that sculpture. Uh, mm -hmm. Tell me about it and, and where you're going with it. You know, Self-Made Man was inspired at a Tony Robbins event. Uh, I went to a date with Destiny in 2014. And I was at a transition point in my career and my life where I'd built two successful companies. And I needed a new challenge. Um, and I wasn't sure exactly what to do yet, but I, I knew of two problems that I was aware of that I thought I could solve. One was in the uh, food production industry, and this is a bit of a rabbit hole, but I live right across the street from the headquarters of Whole Foods here in Austin, Texas, and shopped in the produce section every day. I do a lot of juicing, and if you do some juicing at Whole Foods, you're walking out with $60, $70 worth of produce. It's not cheap. and it really bothered me that you have to be fairly wealthy in the United States just to buy food that is not covered in poison. Right. And I thought that was really screwed up. So I had an idea to essentially solve that problem. And I wanted to put clean organic food in everybody's home at a price they could afford. Mm -hmm. So I actually went out and bought a bunch of books on hydroponics on Amazon mm -hmm. and uh, started to make notes and come up with ideas on how to solve this and fairly simply put it had to produce enough food for you and your family on a, a monthly basis that would replace your run to the grocery store. Mm -hmm. Had to be easy so that everybody could use it. You don't have to have any knowledge of plants and it had to be pretty because it's going to be in your house. Mm -hmm. So I've never developed a physical product, never really grown anything, definitely not dove into tech or hydroponics. So it started on Amazon with a few books and a few phone calls to some industrial design firms and I had a little mock-up made on Photoshop on Odesk. I paid a guy 200 bucks to take this idea and make a little photo of it. And a couple of months later we signed on with a phenomenal firm in Silicon Valley and we're going to make the first automated farm for your house that will grow all of your food. And the idea is how do we decentralize the ag industry? Mm -hmm. Because if you get rid of the farm and the farmer and the tractor and the 18 wheelers and the thousand miles of highway or the massive tankers that float from continent to continent, and if you get rid of the pesticides and the distribution centers and finally the retail center, guess what? Your food goes down 90%. You get rid of 100% of the pesticides and the pollution. And everything starts and ends in your, in your kitchen. Uh, but no one had really ever done that before on a consumer level space. Mm -hmm. You can find little countertop systems you can use to grow some basil or mint, but that was about it. Right. So we built it. We built it about two and a half years. We built a system that would grow about $4,000 a year worth of food and for 400 bucks. Right. And fully automated, you just drop in the seed and the lights take care of everything else and the nutrients and the dosing and the pH balancing and all of that. And it was phenomenal. but it. Uh, almost bankrupted me. <laughs> so, so that was a big lesson learned because I funded all of it. And right as we were getting to a point where, okay, we've got a prototype working, what do we do next? This was my lesson learned in lack of skill set in this industry. Uh, you know, how much longer is this going to take? Well, probably through safety testing, development, package design, you know, service centers, another two years, another two or three million bucks. It's like, oh, because when we first started this, you know, the budget was $500,000, at least that was the estimate. Mm -hmm. We were way beyond that at that point. And so I hit a point where I essentially had to go raise money or pull the plug on it. Mm -hmm. And I ended up talking to a mentor of mine, asking him for advice. And he said, look for a win or a way to win in this, even though it might not look like the initial road that you had intended. Mm -hmm. Can you do anything with your competitors? And so I called up a competing company who had just launched a phenomenal line of products that were like ours. They were had a Y Combinator, had a ton of money, mm -hmm. big team. And I ended up investing in them. Mm -hmm. And I pulled the plug on, on Evergrow, which was the company at the time. And the backup plan after that was Self Made Man. Mm -hmm. And the other problem that I took away from Tony's event was the fact that I've seen at least to 
huge decay in the value system here in the United States from Washington and Wall Street on down. Now it's get the result you want at any cost, whether you have to lie, cheat, or steal. And there was not a lot of pride being taken in craftsmanship and quality and work ethic. It was just, where's my money? Mm -hmm. And I thought that that was going to lead to a really nasty place here in the U.S. a generation from now. You look at how many young men specifically are growing up without dads and role models. Mm -hmm. Really bad situation. Uh, straight out of the shrugged again. Right. So the backup plan was how can we elicit change on a society level uh, you know, paradigm essentially over a generation or two. And looking back in history, I've really only found that there's two ways to do that. Mm -hmm. It's through the barrel of a gun, mm -hmm. as many dictators have done, or it's by indoctrinating the kids and the next generation with a different value set. Right. So obviously for me, I went that route. And the goal for Self Made Man is to really provide young men with mentors and leadership and an education set and a philosophy of life that will uh, you know, lead them to become really productive, honest members of society. And that was the goal. And it really took on a life of its own. How long has it been out there now? We launched the podcast in the end of 2014, beginning of 2015. And that's really all it was at the time. I'm going to do a weekly show with amazing people. Mm -hmm. And then this year, 2018, we launched the education platform that we've been building. And essentially, it's an online school. Mm -hmm. For, for young men with ambition. It's basically the audience that we, we are targeting. Or if you're 18, frankly, to 40, and you have ambition and you want to achieve something more in life, we want to provide you with the mentorship and the knowledge you need to accomplish that. So, so is the way uh, just go to selfmademan.com and people can you mm -hmm. know, uh, find the podcast and other materials there? Yeah. How rewarding has this been for you? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to be getting just a little message from, from someone who is like, man, you're just listening to the podcast sent me down a new direction in life and here's where I was before and here's where I am today. Yeah. And that's really my goal is, uh, you know, I had, a, I had a pretty vivid dream recently where there was a bunch of pictures of families on the wall that I was looking at and they were all super happy and stoked and, and feeling uh, just like they're where they were meant to be. And those were all of the families whose lives essentially had changed direction because they were exposed to what we're building. And so for me, that, that's you know, what I'm after. So after all these years now that you've put into your entrepreneurial career, um, are you finding growth in your fulfillment? Uh, are you finding that's waning or that there's burnout? How are you feeling about it all now? You know, the longer I pursue my career as an entrepreneur, the more I realize I don't know. And Evergrow is a perfect lesson for that where I like to call, I paid a really high stupid tax. <laughs> yeah. You pay the tax and you're gonna pay the tax in one form or another. You're either gonna pay it because you're gonna go out and buy courses in education and acquire the knowledge you need to pursue what you're building, or you're gonna pay it in the form of mistakes, time and money lost. There's no avoiding it, but one choice is better than the other. Yeah. And so, you know, the more I challenge myself, the, the more lessons I learn, and, and I've still got a hell of a long way to go. So, yeah, yeah I, one of my uh, premises or saying, sayings around this is that the great thing about entrepreneurs is that they fall in love with their ideas, mm. but the problem with entrepreneurs is that they fall in love with their yeah. ideas. Yeah, that was a big part of Evergrow, yeah. was learning that and, and getting a lot of pieces, of pieces of wisdom around that from others who'd gone through that. And thankfully, I was, I was willing to listen to them. So we've covered a lot of ground. <laughs> Uh, it's been uh, really, really stimulating. Uh, any final thoughts? You know, the biggest, the biggest lessons I've learned, again, are if you're stuck and you want to become unstuck and make progress, go master a new skill set to the point where you can write a book on it, mm -hmm. the point where you can provide that service or skill set to other people, you know, as a, as a service provider. At that point, you can open so many doors, but as long as you keep reading about that and not doing it, you're going to stay where you're at. Second piece of advice would be to really master your emotions when it comes to money, because making money and keeping money are two very different skill sets, and that's another, another lesson I've had to learn through my career as well. So start to study that now. Start to assume that you've got a million dollars in the bank and start to make a plan for it and to decide how you're going to use it. Uh, and then finally, 
when you have an idea for a solution that can help a lot of people, once again, look for that greatest point of leverage. And know from day one that in order to ascend to that point, it's going to be all about people. It's going to have to, your skill set is going to have to change from creating or selling your product to building a team and, and really growing a great group of people and becoming a leader. And just keep that in mind as well. Great advice, great wisdom. Thanks so much for uh, taking the time to sit and share it with us. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. I'm sure you enjoyed part one of my interview with economist Paul Zane Pilzer. Riveting information. Now, Paul is going to share some strategies with you about where he puts his own money, what his thoughts are about how to take existing wealth and grow it and create cash flow from it. He's done it, so it's not abstract. It's something he's actually put on the ground and made work in his own life, and I think it's very compelling. So enjoy my part two interview with Paul Zinkelzer. Paul, thanks for sitting down with us again. I'm really looking forward to continuing our conversation. Thank you. It's always great to be here with you, Patrick. So you're the only person in the world who's ever made economics completely fascinating to me. <laughs> so, you know, just whenever you were giving presentations, giving your lectures, you know, you really have these very stimulating thoughts about the economy and you kind of talk about varying aspects of economics that when you read them in, in uh, you know, professional papers, they seem very boring, but when you talk about them, they seem very, uh, how can I put it, uh, applicable to my life. <laughs> so now what I want to talk about, and it's something that I've been watching you do you know, over the past years, is saying, hmm, if I've got some money to invest and I need to create cash flow, in my life, like what are some ways to do that? You yourself, I guess we talk about it, the fact that you own some Planet Fitness franchises, for example. What was it that caused you to say, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go invest in some of these franchises and create uh, cash flow from that? Well, frankly, I, like most things, it was happenstance, mm -hmm. or am I calling it a happy accident, yeah. that got me to Planet Fitness. So let me tell you how I got into Planet Fitness, and then we'll come back to your main question which is uh, why Planet Fitness versus other businesses. Mm -hmm. um, in 1991, I didn't know this, I was on Larry King Live TV show, that I knew, mm -hmm. and watching was the founder of Planet Fitness. But he wasn't yet the founder of, founder of Planet Fitness. He was a person with a, frankly, dying gym. Mm -hmm. And he watched me, went out and bought my book, Unlimited Wealth, and used that book as a Bible. His friends joke, it's the only book he ever read. <laughs> and he used that book as his Bible and built Planet Fitness into a then 200 store chain of fitness chain, gyms. Mm -hmm. And it was a fascinating model how he built Planet. Uh, at the time, every gym had an average of about 1,500 members. Mm -hmm. Gold's Gym, 24 Hour Fitness, you remember the gyms that were around Bally's. And at 1,500 members, you barely break even. Right. If you can get to 1,600, 1,700, 1,800, it's all profit because it's a heavy fixed cost business. Right. And that was the gym business. Mm -hmm. And he figured out, not mathematically like I did later on, but he figured out that the right business was to build a gym for 8,000 members. Mm -hmm. Don't fight with every other gym going 1,500, 1,600. Retool the whole engineering process of the gym from signing on the customers using modern technology and iPads, mm -hmm. make it paperless, make all the money collection paperless called electronic funds transfer from your checking account. And he built Planet Fitness in a very successful business. Wow. In 2010, he had his first convention in Las Vegas. Mm. And he was very excited to be bringing together the 200 franchises he had gone around the country and recruited. He said, you know what I want for my keynote speaker? I want Paul Pilzer. <laughs> <laughs> so he hired me as the speaker. And I got very involved with the company. I thought it was a terrific model. People could join a gym for 10 bucks a month and do something about their wellness. Very exciting model. But then once I became known for Planet Fitness as the speaker at their convention and all that goes viral and I'm all over the web as someone speaking about Planet Fitness, people start coming up to me and my family members and saying, wow, Paul owns Planet Fitness. <laughs> and my wife would say, no, we don't own Planet Fitness. Paul's just a paid speaker. But that didn't matter. For everyone she told that to, there were thousands of people who thought Paul owns Planet Fitness because he's all over the web speaking about Planet Fitness. I said to my wife, Lisa, you got me nervous here. They're using my name, they're using my likeness, I like the company, but I don't know anything about it. They've been inviting me for a year now to come visit them at their headquarters in New Hampshire. Why don't you take off, fly to New Hampshire, meet the management team, meet, more important, some of the franchisees, and make sure this is legitimate. She goes, great, takes off in New Hampshire. 
She comes back. She bought a five-story area development agreement <laughs> for Salt Lake City, Without Utah. Without consulting you first? To build stores. Well, <laughs> she made the deal and signed it. But she saw an opportunity and said, this is a great business. Right. People want to lose weight and they need an affordable gym that's honest and lets them quit any time. Right. No commitment, 10 bucks a month. What could be simpler? Right. That's how I got into the Planet Fitness gyms. Wow. So Planet Fitness is exciting to me as a mathematician and economist mm. because of the way in which the business works. If you remember back in high school when you studied quadratic equations, there were two solutions. Mm -hmm. And one was considered a ridiculous solution, mm -hmm. and one was the right solution, and you had to look at which one was practical mm -hmm. and throw out the wrong solution. I've always looked at the wrong solution, which is mathematically correct, solves the problem, as maybe that's the answer. Uh -huh. And a good example of a wrong solution would be Galileo, who looked up at the heavens. Back in the time of Galileo, what could you possibly believe if you looked outside, except that the Earth, is the center of the universe, and the sun comes up over here and revolves this way mm -hmm. around the earth. Right. And the moon and all the planets revolve around the stationary earth. It's wrong, but it's so obvious. Right. And it became our calendar for 5,000 years till Galileo invented the telescope and proved that wrong. Similarly, in a lot of businesses in mathematics, everybody's trying to linearly grow. And in Planet Fitness in the gym business, people are trying to grow from 1,500 members a club to 1,550 to 1,600. Mm -hmm. And the right answer is throw everything you know out about running a 1,500 member club, retool the whole organization for eight to 10,000 members, then go out and get eight to 10,000 members in your gym by low price, honest dealing, and all the good things that go with Planet Fitness. Mm -hmm. So as an economist and a speaker, I was interested in Planet Fitness and became much more interested when my wife started to say, we're gonna open gyms in our business right. here in Utah where we live. And we're gonna use this as a model, she said, to teach our children that retail stores and businesses don't just exist. Mm -hmm. Somebody takes a piece of land, builds a building, mm -hmm. rents to the people, and really works very hard to give someone a great experience. Mm -hmm. But personally, as a head of household, which is actually what economist means, economics literally means a household, and economics is the study of a head of household or a householder back in biblical times. I had no idea. It's the first time I ever heard that. The word Greek economics means household or manager of a household. Wow. Okay. So I'm also, in addition to being an economist and a speaker, I'm a householder. <laughs> I have to pay bills like everybody else. I have to worry that I'm going to make enough money going forward for four children who are now in high school to go off to college. I have to worry about where I might live when I retire and mm -hmm. make investments. And as a head of household, or as a business person, I like Planet Fitness very much because it's primarily a cash flow business. Mm -hmm. You open a business like Planet Fitness, you invest roughly about $2.5 million to $3 million in a store, mm -hmm. and if everything goes well and it works, which most of them obviously do, uh, you're going to make about a $1 million cash flow a year. Something they say in their offering last I saw, 600000 to 800000 but a good successful operator I know can make about a million a year profit per store. Okay. And I had never had businesses like that. Being a tech entrepreneur and an economist, I had always built businesses that served a customer with a product. And along came somebody who wanted it more than I did or I wanted to play with some other toys. And they said, we'll buy this from you. Right. So my life financially, since I left Citibank in 1981, that was my last salary. Mm -hmm. The last time I got a monthly check to live on was 1981 right. when I left Citibank and went out on my own as an entrepreneur. And for better or worse, all of my businesses as an entrepreneur were about initially real estate, buying some land, building something, getting it leased up. And before I could enjoy it, somebody would offer me more money than I thought it was worth, and I would take the money and go off and do something else. So my career from 1981 till 2010 was all about building businesses, not owning businesses. Planet was very different. Planet was a successful franchise, then with 200 stores, today about 1,500 stores. Wow. And Planet was a business that you primarily invested for good cash flow. Mm -hmm. Very taxable, but cash flow. You put in two and a half million and you could earn roughly a 35 to 45% return in monthly cash flow. Right. And that was exciting to me and something that fit the time of my life because I started entering my 60s, I'm 64 years old today, and I look at businesses as not what will this business do for the future 10, 20 years from now, what will this business do next year, next year, next year? Because I like having cash flow coming in. And Planet was really the first business I ever did that brought me current cash. Mm -hmm. And that opened up a whole new world of investing because investing to me was always about growth and multiplying two, three, four X your capital. And this is what's interesting. So you make a distinction between uh, phases of life 
and type of investment that would kind of match with where you are. Absolutely. And that's what we in economics call the utility curve. Utility curve. Let's assume you and I are identical. We certainly have the same hairstyle. <laughs> we certainly have kids who love each other. We have lots of things in common. Right. But how would two smart people do business together mm -hmm. if we have so much in common? What are we going to bring to the table? Mm -hmm. Well, you might have 10 apples and I have 10 oranges. You see right away how even though we're identical in thinking, we value the, everything the same, you don't value oranges the same as I value apples mm -hmm. because we can do a switch. Right. And a utility curve is in utils, literally we use the word util, how much you value each additional apple. Mm -hmm. If you've got 10, not many, right. you want an orange. But once you've got 10 oranges, you want more apples. And utility curves are the reason the economy works. It's the reason very smart people from the same background with the same money will all do business together and want to trade and one do labor work for the other. You might want to clean the kitchen, I might want to clean the den. We might want to own this car, I might want a convertible and we swap. And all of that works into the economy mm -hmm. because people who are similarly situated mm -hmm. have different utility curves. And so with age uh, or phases of life, those utility curves change. Absolutely. When I'm younger, all I want to think about is how do I grow and make money? Right. Um, some people when they're younger ages say, I just want to sp make money and spend it. Right. And they have a very good life when they're young, but often not a very good life when they're 40, 50, 60 years old right. and they haven't saved up money. Now, and so what I find interesting is what you're saying, and I think this is, you know, I'm witnessing this myself because it's like you know, the idea of putting money in investing, letting it accumulate and cash out you know, at, a, at a multiple some years down the road. Now you're saying, hmm, if I put up this type of a thing, in this case a franchise, and I, I'm going to take cash that I have accumulated over years, put it into a franchise, and then every month I'm getting money that literally if I'm not working, I still have income coming in every month from that investment I made. And then you multiply that investment with multiple franchises and actually it turns into maybe more money you made than you were, when you were working. The key in, to investing once you're an adult, mm -hmm. or even say over 30 or 40, is the term harvesting. Mm -hmm. When are you going to harvest your crop? Yeah. So if you're going to start a business and you're younger, I'm willing to wait 10, 20 years because I fully expect young people think they're invincible. Right. I'll be around. At 64 today, the first thing I look at when I look at investment is what's the likely time horizon mm -hmm. for when this investment will return me either current cash flow or residual cash flow after it's sold or cash flow from growing the business and selling it to someone else. And harvesting time has become an all-important criteria for me. Mm -hmm. I invest in funds where other people pool my money with other money and do great things, but the first thing I want to know is, is this fund got a 10-year horizon or a 20-year horizon? If it's a long-term land development project and I'm investing in it, it might have three, four-decade horizon. Right. Now, I also have four kids who right now I'm not too focused on their residual. i got to get them through high school and get them to college. Right. But at some point, if they were my business partners and they're 30 years old, I might think, oh, I'll go back to taking a long-term horizon because I don't need the money, but my children might want it. But that's for the future. But you start to see that you should be driven by your family situation. What do you need to live on? What do you need today? What does your spouse need? What does your partner need? What do your children need? Do you have any special needs children? And then project that forward over a likely lifespan. And you see how that's going to be the most important criteria, the time return for harvesting and making an investment as you age. You know, and that, you're the first person I, I heard say that because I think that's a critical consideration because a lot of people say, you know, they have different models of investing. Here's my investing advice. Here's how I think you should do it. And certainly people talk about, uh, you know, levels of risk and, 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 you know, harvest time as far as, you know, what age are you and here's what I'd recommend, et cetera. But you're almost starting from the value standpoint of saying, wait a minute, I'm a human being with a family. And if I've got kids in, the, in, in their 30s and we want to create some kind of a family business with the money that I've accumulated, that's a strong consideration as to the decisions I would make as compared to my kids are off doing their own thing and successful in their own right and I, you know, I've got a, a separate thing or I have no kids. All those are, are really uh, considerations. So it's not like who has the best investment advice. It's starting by saying what are my circumstances and what's applicable to me based on those circumstances. We really learned that as a civilization in the post baby boom years. Mm -hmm. Prior to the baby boom, we're including most of the baby boom. Baby boom. It's about making money. Yeah. What do you do when you make a lot of money, Dad? I make more money. And what do you do? I make more money. It sounds crazy. Yeah. And the baby boom was the first generation between rock music and all the things that we love doing that said, maybe I don't want to make just more money. Maybe I want to do something environmentally sound 
and make a little less money. Right. Maybe I want to make money now, more cash flow. Maybe I want to save for the future. Even though I'm not spending it, I sleep real well at night. Yeah. And the baby boomer really started applying utility curves to them and their children, all the way to the millennials that we might argue completely apply utility curves <laughs> without thinking of how they're going to pay bills because they got a rich baby boomer dad or mom right. to take care of them. <laughs> right. So we really need to identify first who are we at our stage in life when you're about to do an investment. Most important, before you worry about how much and how are you going to make money, when are you going to make money? Right. The most important thing, if you invest money now, and I'm talking anyone over 30, when does harvest time come around? Remember, the sooner it harvests, the less risk. Right. But guess what? The sooner it harvests, probably the less return. Right. And you need to quantify that and figure out your time horizon of investing before you figure out how you're going to invest, how you're going to manage your money, and bring happiness. Because ultimately, money is really not about gross domestic product and increasing. It's about gross national happiness. Mm -hmm. And gross national happiness is a defined term by the United Nations. They spend $180 million a year collecting the data that goes into a database each year to determine which countries are happy. But as we look around, it's which people are happy, mm -hmm. which children of ours are happy, which of our friends and relatives are, and how do we get them more happier? Right. And you start to see how utility curves, time horizons to invest, all enter into a new formula we're entering into called, I want more gross national happiness, mm -hmm. or gross domestic happiness, to be more accurate, versus I just want to make money. Right. So now, and that's another interesting thing, saying, okay, it's the what do I invest in, but of course the, the when. You know, when do I harvest is another question. And then the why means, like, what are my values? Like, as you're saying, maybe I also care about the environment. So, you know, let's call it the legacy side of it. You know, there's some maybe legacy issues that are important to you. So, uh, so it's not as simple as just saying, oh, follow this guru and do what they say because they know the right thing. It's, it's different for everybody. Right. And what we also see is a reemergence of the franchise business. Mm. And once I got into Planet Fitness, I started looking around at other franchises. Mm. And I found that Planet was not unique. There were many other franchise businesses that had developed a formula, had continual R&D, and that were attractive. In the past, I've always been the entrepreneur who started a business. Mm -hmm. I literally took a blank slate building, I invented it, I drew it out on paper, I had a lot of fun doing it, and I built a business. Mm -hmm. Some of them worked, some of them didn't. At this stage in my life, I don't have time for that. Mm -hmm. I need a business that, tell, show me the thousands of people who have done it, Show me the thousands of people who have made it work for them, and then take their situation, and I'm not gonna copy them, I'm not gonna reinvent the wheel, mm -hmm. I'm gonna license it. Right. And that's really where the franchise business comes in. Our world changes so fast today, and the product you make and the customer you have changes so fast with the internet. You used to open a store, and it was on a certain street, and your loyalty with your customers coming by. Mm -hmm. And if your product wasn't so great after a while, they still came by, mm -hmm. they told you, and you had time to fix it. Right. Today with the internet, if there's a better product for your customer, you're lucky if you last a nanosecond <laughs> before somebody clicks on that product versus your product. Right. You've gotta have a huge R&D department in almost every business to stay on top of your customer, not just serve your existing customer. And that's where I've come to really enjoy franchises like Planet Fitness, who today, I think the stock price is about $4.8 billion. Wow. Uh, we had an IPO of about roughly a billion and a half dollars two years ago. It's now trading at about 4.8. Wow. And more important, the company spends on new products, new services, and always brings them in. So our Planet Fitness operators can just run their gym and know at convention time, when they come together once a year, or just daily, because they get an email from corporate, it's going to talk about new things we're exploring that might work in your gym, new things on trial you might want to be. The whole company is really a big R&D department to make sure we stay ahead with the latest technology. And that you see behind the scenes in any business you go into. Go into any fast food outlet, any item. It's not just the items changing, it's the technology of delivering it. It's their sources. My son just took a job, he's 16 years old, at Starbucks. I am overwhelmed by the technology at Starbucks that goes into training him, monitoring him, the values they're teaching him. They've got whole programs and videos for every possible situation. He had to learn how to serve deaf people. And he says, next week I'm gonna learn how to serve deaf and blind people. Mm -hmm. These are amazing life experiences. I should pay Starbucks mm -hmm. for what they're delivering to my 16-year-old son. Mm -hmm. But the learning experience is amazing, and there's no way if I own my own coffee place, I could add that much to environment, hire a bright 16-year-old kid, and teach him how to serve people. Yeah, and with the whole franchise approach, 
you, the franchises you own are sellable, right? I mean, it's, it's not like you just get cash flow and then it burns out. It's like somebody can come in and say, I still want to buy that business. Yes and no. Mm -hmm. They're absolutely saleable. But I notice so far, my observation, I haven't studied this as an economist, I've studied this as a business person looking for good business opportunities for myself and hopefully one day my children. And what I see is that my high tech business, which is always built on growth, when I go to sell, my typical exits are 20 to 40 times cash flow. Mm -hmm. So if I'm earning a nickel, they'll pay me a dollar for that business. Right. Not that they want to earn a nickel, the new owner. Right. Well, let's get real specific here. I build a business for a million dollars. It's making 50 grand a year, 5%. Somebody buys it for 10 to $2 million. Mm -hmm. It's earning down them 2.5%, mm -hmm. but they think it's growing very fast. Right. With franchise businesses and retail businesses, for some reason, I don't have any defined reason why, the multiples are not uh, 0.05 cap rate, which means you sell it 20 times your, your uh, cash flow. They're more like three, four, five times. You sell a business for five times cash flow. Mm -hmm. I think that's because retail businesses require an intense amount of effort on behalf of the owner. They require amazing diligence, and you take your eye off the ball, it drops fast. Mm -hmm. The customer doesn't tell you he had a bad meal. My father taught me when I had a bad meal to politely ask the person, is the manager here? Mm -hmm. Better yet, come by during the day when they're not crowded and tell the manager, I've enjoyed this place for years. We had a bad meal. Mm -hmm. I'm not here to complain. I want you to fix it before something happens. Mm -hmm. And I was brought up that that's what a businessman does for another businessman. Right. Today, nobody cares. Yeah. You have a bad meal. Just think of the last meal that didn't meet expectations or a product. Yeah, they're getting one-star reviews on Google. and uh, you know, or, no or no reviews. Or no reviews, yeah. Till the customers all go away. Yeah. And so what we start to see is retail business is something that you've got to focus on. And most franchises, maybe because someone's done a lot of the intellectual property work, you're lucky if you can get out at five times. Now, the good news, during the 10 years you might own and run it, you're earning 20% on your money. Yeah. And you can borrow money at 10% or 11%, pay off interest on your, the money you borrowed, and still earn 20% on the total amount of money, or 30%. So the franchise businesses let you get the cash flow earlier, but don't have the amazing residuals when you go to sell. Yeah, not, not the big exit. But, I, but at the same time, like if I were to consider, uh, somebody said, well, maybe I'll buy real estate, I'll buy an apartment building, and I'll collect rent every month. But the cash flow on that rent relative to the investment you put in I don't think it's anything close to what you're describing in a franchise. And maybe the real estate would go up in value a lot, maybe it won't, who knows. But if you're still saying, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sell this thing for, more, for much more than what it cost me to put it up, and I collected all this cash along the way, that seems like a, a pretty attractive way to, to, to go for people who are looking, who've worked hard for some period of years or has maybe, an, maybe it's an inheritance, you know, uh, parents mm -hmm. die and they left you some money saying, what do I do with this? It seems like an attractive way to, to generate what some people like to refer to as passive income. I never think it's totally passive, but it's, it's not you having to go to work every day to, for a paycheck type well, income. Well, franchises really are. Most mm -hmm. franchise businesses, which generally means most retail businesses, mm -hmm. or businesses that serve things like cleaning houses or cleaning build, office buildings or some type of franchise business where someone developed a model, they require an intense amount of focus by the entrepreneur individual franchise owner. Mm -hmm. If they didn't, the parent company would never sell you one. Right. If Planet Fitness could have built 1,600 corporate stores all owned by that wonderful guy, Mike, back in New Hampshire, mm -hmm. he would have done it. Yeah. But he found the most important criteria to making a successful gym was the owner, mm -hmm. the manager who sits there and hires the best people, makes his employees learn everyone's name, and builds a family business around an individual gym. And he found the only way he could grow that was making everyone his partner in a franchise environment. And that's why you rarely see a franchise that doesn't require, despite what people tell you, a lot of hands-on work. How many hours a week do you spend right now on, uh, you know, in your two franchises? Well, I don't, but my wife goes there virtually every day. Oh, really? Okay. But she enjoys going there yeah. every day. She walks around the gym. She talks to people. How are you? And they say, great. And how do you like Planet Fitness? Oh, I love it. And the, what, who are you? Oh, well, my family, she says, owns this particular franchise. Mm. Wow, I love it. And she loves the karma she gets. Right. She makes a lot of money at it because right. that's the byproduct of serving society. Mm -hmm. If you serve a product to someone very well and make them very happy, trust me, you'll make a lot of money. <laughs> the moment you take your eye off the product and the end use customer mm -hmm. and how much they're enjoying it, the moment you don't get really upset when someone has a bad experience right. in your business, right. get out of the business because it's going to kick you out.
<laughs> it's an interesting uh, term. It's going to kick you out. You brought up one of my other areas I think is ripe for huge investment opportunity, mm -hmm. and that's real estate, but not necessarily the real estate you think of. Mm -hmm. Most people think of real estate like you buy an apartment building. Mm -hmm. You buy some type of commercial space, tenant shows up, and you just sit there for collecting coupons for the next 20 years. No longer. The reason is that the real estate needs of people are changing. Mm -hmm. I recently became a significant investor in funds that invest in senior housing. Mm -hmm. And a typical senior housing project is about 110 apartments, 120 apartments, that seniors who are moving out of the town, might be Allentown, Pennsylvania, or some mm -hmm. area in California, where they are moving to Florida, but they no longer need the big house. Right. But they want to get an apartment that they can still see the grandkids from, mm -hmm. but they also think, because they're 67 years old, how will I age in this apartment? Mm -hmm. how, what's the floor plan like? How will I stay here if I'm ever disabled, mm -hmm. or my spouse is, and I want to stay together? Mm -hmm. So we start to see a whole new need arising, which no one is filling today, for senior housing, mm -hmm. because it's changing so fast. Right. Seniors might say, I could live at home till I die if only I had someone just eight minutes a day to help me get dressed in the morning. Mm -hmm. We call that senior assisted living. Right. And all of that is up for grabs right now. So the funds I invest in are buying thousands, tens of thousands of senior housing units. And I work with them on a technology committee to how can we improve senior housing? What kind of products and services would a senior want? The first thing I notice when I go into a senior housing project is at the end of the night, they have a piece of paper and they walk down the hall going, Mr. Gintempo, did you take your medicine tonight? Mm -hmm. Great, click. I look at that piece of paper, and that should be an iPad. Because right. somewhere there's a grandchild or a child who would love to know, Dad took his medicines at 11.02 p.m. Right. You and I don't want to know that, but we wouldn't want to know it around our own kids, right. especially if they don't live with us, right. to know they took their medicine, to know they had breakfast, to know they went bowling today. And so we start to see just opening up with transparency the activities of senior living to the people below them, meaning to their children and grandchildren, is a huge business ripe for the taking. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things I'm working on now as a board member and consultant, and I see wide open as we move to housing that really doesn't exist, senior-assisted housing that really adds value for seniors, because then you can up the rent in a good way, and people will be thrilled to pay it, because yeah. they're getting real value for it, not just a place to put grandma. So I know uh, from prior conversations we've had that you put a lot of money into that. Uh, what's, what's your time horizon on that one, though? Um, very good point. I disagree with the funds I invest in. They invest in a three- to six-year horizon. Mm -hmm. They spend three years. They raise typically 50 or $100 million per fund. Mm -hmm. They spend three years buying apartment pro uh, senior projects or whatever our projects are. Then they spend, turn them around, fix them up, add value then spend three years selling. Mm -hmm. They're very into adding value and selling. Mm -hmm. I think that's crazy because we're selling deals at an eight or 9% rate of return. I'm earning two or 3% on T-bills at the bank. Right. I don't want more money to earn to two and 3% that was earning eight or nine. And I tell them, hold on to it longer. Yeah. They go, not so fast, Paul. Our business of funds and how we're known on Wall Street is we give you back your money every six years. Mm -hmm. There are other funds that run by different companies that have a 10 or 20 year horizon Fortunately or unfortunately, I'm not in them. So we keep making our money every three to six years, getting it back, and I keep investing with the same I was going to say, but you, at that point, it's kind of nice to get it back because you can decide, do I want to reinvest or I would like cash now so I don't have to reinvest. So at least you have some options relative to that. So real estate, um, in, the, in the ways that you, you're know, putting in real estate funds that are doing things that are uh, you know, seemingly uh, a market match. Or real you. estate yourself where you develop a niche in a neighborhood and start adding value, mm -hmm. which might be converting a small apartment project to senior housing. Mm -hmm. It might be buying yourself a house on a particular neighborhood that fits where people all go to a church nearby or a synagogue that people, you know who your customer is. Mm -hmm. The real value coming in real estate, I see, is value add investing. You buy real estate, mm -hmm. any type of real estate. Mm -hmm. You improve it for a specific purpose or type of customer, mm -hmm. and then you sell it. Versus the old days of, I'm, I'm in real estate, I'll buy anything in real estate. Right. Those days are gone. You've got to know a market before you go into it and try to develop some specialty niche for mm -hmm. your customer. So outside of real estate and, uh, and franchises, any other considerations that you think are good investments for people to consider? I would say all, ones, all investments that you yourself are the person working at heart. Mm -hmm. Generally, if it's a business that uses technology, which virtually everyone does today, I like franchises because I don't think you're going to be able to invest the time and money. And I'd rather buy, I call it buy retail, I'd rather pay top dollar mm -hmm. for a really high quality franchise 
that I know is going to work if I play it out, mm -hmm. then take the risk on the new startup franchise that someone like Paul Pilzer might start because right. they don't always work out and that you get a higher return, but they're very risky at the very beginning stages. So let's give this scenario. Um, somebody's coming up on retirement. They're not you know, there yet, but it's coming up pretty quickly. How old? Um, let's say 50s, um, you know, mid 50s. Uh, they're going to, uh, they, they've got some work life left, but they also say, oh, your retirement's coming up and I'm looking and I, I really don't have the resources to just say I'm going to retire. I don't want to live on Social Security. Uh, what, what should they be thinking about? Mm -hmm. Well, it's a great time to be asking that question. Mm -hmm. And the reason is underlying everything we do today is the sharing economy. Mm -hmm. In the past, I would say this is a person who likes theater, likes things he wants to do and wants to have money for the enjoyable things of life. This is a person who has certain kind of housing needs but doesn't have the money to buy the housing. Everything changes in a sharing economy mode because all of a sudden we can share our real estate, mm -hmm. we can share our dinners, share our areas with people of like personality, of like interest, and add huge value. You don't want money to just go to restaurants. You want to have great restaurant experiences. Mm -hmm. My wife is a real foodie, but when I go to a restaurant, you know what makes the real experience? You. Yeah. It's the person I'm dining with and telling me about the wine and we share and we figure it out. That's much more important to adding value. Right. I'm amazed when I look around a restaurant, particularly when I see someone sitting alone who might be traveling. Right. Can't we figure that out yet with a, with a cell phone? That there's a person here who's interested in model trains, seven other boring hobbies that I think boring, he thinks are great, mm -hmm. has three kids at this school, and wow, I've got so much in common that if we only could know those things about each other, we'd have fun in a restaurant. Now the kids do this well for dating and sex, mm -hmm. but it goes beyond just dating and sex, particularly when you get older. Mm -hmm. You wanna have real meaningful relationships or great dinner conversations. And so the sharing economy first helps us find people mm -hmm. of like interest. Then it finds the restaurant, the place we wanna go of like interest, and before it even reveals who's who, I know this person went to my college, I pressed a button to verify that, so we're both sharing the right info, and what does he want out of me? Companionship on one meal. So the sharing economy has the ability with technology mm -hmm. to deliver so much value add at much lower prices because by definition it's sharing to individuals. But what we see with retired people is we all have the same needs. Mm -hmm. So once we focus on it, I would tell your friend who's about to retire to start chronicling their life hour by hour. Get up in the morning and say, what did you do at 4 p.m.? What did you think of at 5 p.m.? What did you think of at 6 p.m.? What did you need on the way home from work at 7 p.m.? Mm -hmm. And then try to think, are there other similarly situated mm -hmm. individuals at my age, with my interests, in my locale, who also might want to share with me in producing these items for others or just consuming them for ourselves? Because your individual needs in the sharing economy are the needs of other similarly situated people. And as you tune into them, you should look at them as a business opportunity for a franchise you may want to buy mm -hmm. to serve people in your neighborhood or just meeting up with people who have common interests and common goals. So, for example, you're saying you know, there could be more shared real estate, like saying maybe two people are, who are getting ready to retire, two couples getting ready to retire. Crazy. My wife and I love Singapore. Right. And there are many things we like about it. But 30 years ago, 50 years ago, when I was just dreaming of going to work at Citibank, I knew about Singapore. Singapore is 12 hours off Eastern Standard Time Zone. Mm -hmm. So Singapore has all these buildings owned by Citibank, Deutsche Bank, that run 24 hours a day. All the buildings and retail runs 24 hours a day. The streets are so lit up at night, you leave work at midnight or 2 in the morning and you go to dinner. And you're going on a beautiful river, you don't even know it's nighttime. Right. And what's exciting about Singapore is they use the real estate 168 hours a week. Mm. We use our real estate 40 hours a week. Think about just the real estate that you use and how you could share it. You only sleep in it 60 hours a week. Right. And you've got 168 hours. We've got to figure out beds and situations where somebody, like a hotel room that rents by the 12-hour cycle, mm -hmm. not a 24-hour cycle. And you start to see so many opportunities of using just the real estate we have in multiple ways. Here in Utah, we have a center for American Express. It has 10,000 desks. Mm -hmm. You've probably spoken to people there if you have an American Express card mm -hmm. and wanted help. But it doesn't have in the 10,000 desks 10,000 employees. It has 35,000 employees who come in and work eight hours and then move off. They get off at midnight, but midnight is eight in the morning or 8 p.m. in Madagascar where they happen to work with their customers. And what's exciting when you see this American Express Center, you see someone taking a piece of real estate that was meant to serve 10,000 desks 
used very productively by 35,000 people so that as the earth turns and someone needs help with their American Express card or a merchant needs to know why this charge didn't go through, they pick up the phone and a person right here in Utah with their local dialect, local language, answers in the guy in Madagascar or South Korea right. or Japan and helps them. And we start to see the opportunities to use what we have multiple, multiple hours, not just for ourselves, but great business opportunities to apply that to people who are similarly situated. And what we really see is we all want companionship, we want fun, we want friends, and the technology world has yet to really deliver. Each time I go to a party somewhere, and what makes a great party for me? At my age, it's when I meet someone really interesting mm -hmm. and I want to follow up. And once in a while, I'm lucky. I go to a party, we talk small talk, we talk business, and I meet one or two new people, sometimes a friend of yours, mm -hmm. and we go, wow, let's have lunch or dinner. But that only happens when you go over and introduce me to somebody new right. and give me some background on them and probably told them, there's this economist I want you to meet. You put some work into it. Right. And I look at my phone and go, somewhere in the rest of the phones in this room, there's 50 people here <laughs> that I could have something in common with right. and would like to meet. And I don't want to sell them anything or buy anything from them. I just want to talk about our latest hobby or something in politics or I love economics, talk about economics. But no one's walking around reading my mind and their mind. And that's some of the future things coming with technology that will greatly improve the quality hour by hour of our personal relationships. So Paul, as usual, extraordinarily stimulating conversation. Very much appreciate your time. Any final thoughts before we close? You should always remember that value in life comes from serving another human being. Mm -hmm. When you can bring a smile to a child, your spouse, your friend, or yourself, you're happy. Mm -hmm. And what we want to do is bring more happiness. And business at its root is serving another human being. It's making them happy by delivering something they want for less money or time that they could do it themselves. And when you deliver it and make them happy, that's when you get your reward. And that's what's so exciting to me about economics. I see this wonderful world out there of seven and a half billion people trying to find an edge to how to serve another human being better. That's what makes economics. That's what drives them to success. That's great. And I think in the end, that's the moral virtue of capitalism, right? Is people serving other people and being rewarded for doing so. So terrific. Well, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you, Patrick. It's always a pleasure. Capitalism.com. What a great URL for the Money Revealed docuseries. Next up, I have one of the two interviews I did with Ryan Moran, who is the founder and owner of Capitalism.com. In this particular interview, he gets tactical on how to grow successful businesses. So if you don't have a pen and pad handy right now, you might want to pause and get one. There's going to be a lot of notes that you can take away from this interview that will be helpful to you. Enjoy it. So Ryan, great to have this conversation we want to get more practical now, strategies, how what you see is working is for people in entrepreneurial careers or seeking entrepreneurial careers or even side hustle saying, hey, you know, I have my normal job, but here's something I, you know, I'm trying to look for something on the side to expand uh, my income, et cetera. And you said you've got a lot of passion around this. So uh, tell me some of your thoughts regarding those issues. Yeah, th this is my jam, okay. you would say. Uh -huh. So in my, my work, I, I, I basically help people create a, a plan to get them their, their first million dollar business mm -hmm. and have, have helped been a part of several hundred successful businesses um, that have either resulted in people selling their business or making it their full-time thing or, or, or side thing. And the, the first thing that we have to identify here is what we spoke about previously of disconnecting the idea of time worked versus money earned. Right. Because ultimately, as Jim Rohn would have said, or did say, we're compensated for the value we bring to the marketplace. It takes time to produce value, but we're not paid for the time. We're paid for the value that we bring to the marketplace. Right. And we, can, we do that by doing things that create a scalable impact throughout the rest of the world or our world. So, one of, the, one of the ways that we've done this at capitalism.com is through physical products brands. The, the kind of aha formula that a lot of our students say is when the light bulb came on mm -hmm. is if we have three to five products mm -hmm. selling 20 to 35 units per day mm -hmm. at an average price point of 25 to 35 dollars, that's a million dollar business. Okay. And we could run those numbers a couple of different ways. But three to five products selling about 30 sales a day is about 100 sales a day at an average price point of about $30 mm -hmm. is a million dollar business. 
And that million dollar business is usually when we have something we can either scale mm -hmm. or something that we can sell. Mm -hmm. And I believe that the fast lane to financial freedom is to build a business mm -hmm. and invest the profits. And if I were to say the fasterish lane mm -hmm. would be to build a business and sell it mm -hmm. and then invest that for passive income so that you can define life on your own terms. And for some people that means you then double down on another business. Right. And for other people to say, I'm done, I'm gonna now do what I would like for a few years. And either one is totally cool because you're responsible for the results that you get and the way that you pursue happiness. So uh, I want to talk about the blueprint that you have for this, uh, but before I do, uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to fast forward to one of the things you just said, and then we'll go back. Um, when you say that, okay, because let's say I'm a, a dentist, I'm 50 years old, I've accumulated a good amount of money, but I want side money or I want to be able to create passive income. Maybe I'm starting to look toward retirement and I, I don't want to just retire my capital and burn it. I want to figure out a way to use that mm -hmm. in, a, in a way that works in today's world where it can provide me passive income. What are your, some of your suggestions around that? I think every single person should be taking 10% of their take home income mm -hmm. and automatically placing that into some sort of a long-term investment. Okay. So for me, that's just, I have E-Trade deduct a certain amount for my checking mm -hmm. account every month and I go and I put that in a dividend paying stock. Mm -hmm. Now I would say I am like in step three of the process mm -hmm. because I've built a business, I've sold businesses, mm -hmm. I've invested for enough passive income to where my life is taken care of and now I'm investing for really long-term wealth. Right. For some people, if you don't have that side business that is producing some sort of exponential return, mm -hmm. that's the first investment that I would make to someone who is entrepreneurial. Okay. So if somebody was set on staying in their job and just doubling down on their career, I would say, okay, that's gonna be your source of income. Let's go to step two and invest for passive income. Mm -hmm. But for the person who doesn't want that life or they want something on the side or they want the thing to replace their job, I'd say that 10% of your take home pay mm -hmm. needs to be being set aside for that side business that is going to ultimately, hopefully, create the income that's gonna replace the job that you're working. And the number one thing that you can be doing with that 10% mm -hmm. is to be in education mm -hmm. and learning as much about business and advertising as possible. Mm -hmm. So I think that the, the hack, if you will, to creating income on demand is by having an audience, mm -hmm. is by having people who pay attention when you distribute information to them. And that can, that can come in the form of a YouTube uh, channel, mm -hmm. it can come from a podcast, mm -hmm. it can come from a blog, right. it can come from people reading your Facebook posts, mm -hmm. uh, it can re come from an email list, it can come from Facebook Messenger, mm -hmm. it can come from Twitter, it can come from Pinterest, it can come from Instagram. We can go on and on and on mm -hmm. forever. So if there are people, even if it's a few hundred people mm -hmm. who actively digest whatever you put into the world, uh -huh. we can turn that into enough money to do damage. Yeah. And to get to that first few hundred, it'll take a few dollars. Mm -hmm. And by a few dollars, it could be as simple as 500 or a thousand dollars for us to put something onto a channel, advertise it to people who would benefit from it mm -hmm. until we have a few hundred or a few thousand people following our work on Facebook, Instagram, our blog on and on forever, wherever you're putting your content. That audience is your hack mm -hmm. to creating income on demand. And we can go into how to do that, but that is that is like absolute foundation, step one of how you create a predictable income stream that is not tied to anything except the value you're bringing to the world. Let's go ahead and, and dig deeper then since we're on it. So uh, go ahead and talk about that a little bit more as far as saying, okay, uh, maybe like kind of give a, a scenario. So you got this person, here's the amount of money they have to invest and here's the process. Yeah, so it, I mean, if somebody has, I was asked once, if I have an extra $500 a month, what mm -hmm. should I do with it? And I'd say I'd put it all on advertising whatever content you're producing in the world. Mm -hmm. So if you are a dentist and your passion is dentistry, right. and you wanna have a business that serves other dentists, then you need to be putting out content for other dentists right. and advertising that on whatever platform you are most comfortable distributing that content. And a lot of people will debate over the best place is Pinterest, mm -hmm. the best place is Facebook, no, it's Instagram, it's, now it's Snapchat. Mm -hmm. Some people will say do all of them. Yeah. I say do whichever one you naturally do. Right. Because you're gonna continue doing that. Right. Mm -hmm. So for me, 
I will sometimes write blog posts when I feel inspired. Right. That usually happens on planes or when I'm super relaxed on vacation. Mm -hmm. But give me a microphone or a camera, I'll talk all day. <laughs> Proof. <laughs> <laughs> so if there's a camera or a microphone, I can produce content all day long. Right. So that's why I have a full-time videographer. Mm -hmm. Now, I didn't always have a full-time videographer, but I did always have a $30 microphone that I plug into my laptop and I start communicating ideas about business and investing to the world, and I spend a few hundred dollars a month to boost that content. Right. That would be step one at its foundation, how we're gonna get this ball rolling. And to be clear, the content you're giving, it's a giveaway, it's free content. What you're paying for or investing in, I should say, is to build an audience. Right, okay. that's exactly it. Yeah. Because there's, there's a, a deposit into a relationship bucket, right? right? Every interaction that you have on the internet or in person mm -hmm. is ultimately a value exchange. Right. And your job at the beginning is to start depositing checks mm -hmm. into that relationship bucket from the people who are following you. And if your content is halfway decent and you're targeting the right people, mm -hmm. the people who would benefit the most, a few hundred or a thousand people is enough to get the ball rolling in terms of monetization. Right. And I would say you want to make the deposits in the relationship account as long as possible before you ask for a, a withdrawal. Right. But for most people at about a thousand followers, that's when we could start to monetize it. Yeah, and, and what's interesting is that if somebody say, well, if I were to take that $500 a month and put it into you know a, a stock or put it into something else, first of all, it's then out of your control uh, in the sense that it's now you're investing in somebody else's dream, not your own. Yeah. But then secondly, the return on this investment is likely much higher if you build that audience and get it to that thousand plus mark. My first successful physical products brand was a sports nutrition company called Sheer Strength. Mm -hmm. I started, I ordered my first line of product with, for $600 mm -hmm. and I sold that for more than $10 million. I'm a majority stake for more right. than $10 million. I still hold a minority stake, mm -hmm. which will probably be another eight figure payday right. at some point. That's a pretty good ROI, yeah. right? That's that is better than Bitcoin. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that is that is that is better than any index fund, right? I mean right. that that only happens because you are now investing sweat and education and intelligence and time into something that is going to create an exponential return. Now, there's a dimension of this. The did you have personally a passion in? fitness products. Absolutely, yeah. And and how key is it that you're passionate about whatever it is that you're looking to promote as compared to saying, I think, oh, that's a good idea, even though I'm not that uh, emotionally invested in what it is. Passion is an asset. Mm -hmm. It's not a necessity. Mm -hmm. Passion is an asset in a field of assets. Right. Time is an asset. Mm -hmm. Money is an asset. Connections are an asset. Mm -hmm. An audience is an asset. Passion is an asset. Okay. And all of these things make results happen faster, mm -hmm. or they open up opportunities, or they give you the grit to keep going. Right. So talking about this with you is energizing for me. It's a passion of mine, mm -hmm. which means at the end, I'll probably be sad it's over. <laughs> right? If this, if, since this is my work day, right. but at the end, I'll be sad that it's over. I'll want to keep going, yeah. which means if another interview showed up, I would want to participate in it. Right. So that's an asset because it means that I can contribute more. It means that I can do more work because I've got more energy right. to do it. Now, for some people, all they have is money, but they have no time or right. they have no specific interests or passions. So their, pro their best route is probably to be an investor. Mm -hmm. Great. It's your job to analyze the opportunities and deploy your best asset into however is going to best serve you. For some people, all they have is time. So for a while, they're just going to be trading that time for dollars until they find the thing that they want to focus on. And for some people, it's passion. All they want to do is get up in the morning and golf or play video games or whatever they're interested in. All of those opportunities can be monetized. Mm -hmm. I don't have that one passion, that one thing that I want to do all day. And I think part of the, the confusion that people get about passion is that they think it has to be found. Right. They think that there's one thing outside of themselves that they have to discover. And if they don't discover that one thing, then they're never going to be happy or successful. I mm -hmm. am one of those people that doesn't have that. Mm -hmm. I love baseball. My dream is to own the Cleveland Indians. Yeah. 
But after, you know, 162 game season, I'm ready for a break. Now come December, I'm ready for the season to start again. <laughs> right. But I, I think that uh, e even, even I, who am passionate about what I'm doing, don't have the one thing that I could do forever. And so I have more of a feeling that I pursue. Right. I have interests that I cultivate. I think passions and interests are cultivated, not discovered. They are, we, we invest in them, we grow them over time, and it becomes an asset, but it is certainly not the only asset that leads to success. So would you say though that, uh, that capitalism is an overarching passion for all these things that you're doing, that that's kind of like the, the driving thing that, that is, is constant fuel for all these, uh, your respective activities? I'd say that capitalism is a great word that represents my collective interests. Yeah. And, and I studied economics mm -hmm. during the 2008 political election mm -hmm. while I was building my first business mm -hmm and the economy was tanking. Right. So my interest just happened to be business, politics, mm -hmm. economics, and talking. <laughs> and so capitalism and leading a message of capitalism mm -hmm. happens to well represent what I'm doing in the world. And now, I guess, in your own story as an example, so then you, you have a liquidation event uh, you, you know, you, uh, from this business that you created in the way that you just described, how, how, how you do it and how you recommend other people do it. And then you pivoted toward investor. Um, so, because now investment's a part of what you do. And I think, again, going back to that scenario of somebody like a dentist or somebody in that realm that says, you know, I've been working for a lot of years, I've got really some capital now. Um, and I, I really don't know how to think like an investor, or how to approach you know, making investments. Uh, do you have anything to say about that? Yeah, so just to complete the point, I think that if you don't have a side thing or a business that is not connected to your time, mm -hmm. the first thing you should be investing in is that. Right. And if you don't know what that thing is, mm -hmm. then the thing you need to be investing in is a skill set mm -hmm. that you can take to clients or customers and sell in the marketplace. Okay. So whether that is running advertising or it is, I know, I know somebody who charges $20,000 to set up a podcast, mm -hmm. right? Because he's one of the best in the world at submitting your podcast to iTunes or whatever, right. whatever it is, right. right? So the first thing is, do you have a skill set that you can take to the marketplace? And for a lot of people, and I've seen this work really well for people, they take their job and they go take a couple side clients mm -hmm. and say, this is the result that I get for people. Mm -hmm. These are the connections that I have from my 20 years of experience working at the, in the corporate world. Right. I can bring this to your organization mm -hmm. and I'm gonna charge you four grand a month. And since now that is your side hustle and that's your first skin in the game mm -hmm. to have your first business. Right. And if you're building an audience while doing that, getting clients is really easy or selling product is really easy. I know, for example, I have a friend who's a medical doctor mm -hmm. And this, this medical doctor puts a lot of content out just on his own personal Facebook page. Mm -hmm. And on that Facebook page, he talks about inflammation mm -hmm. and reducing inflammation and his opinion on inflammation and why it's a problem. I don't know anything about this, but he talks about it at length. Well, one day, just on a whim, he posted on his Facebook page, look, I'm thinking about developing a supplement mm. that would meet my criteria for something I think someone should take or something. And he, uh, he, he had about 100 people respond to that. And, and he started taking deposits mm -hmm. for this first product and delivering it in, in bags, like Ziploc bags, which looks super sketchy, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he pre-sold 100 units right. at, you know, he, I think he sold like a, a, a three month or six month supply for $1,000. Mm -hmm. Right, which funded the build out of the entire business, which he'll now get feedback, blood work from these patients. Right. And asterisks, I hope I'm not violating any medical, <laughs> medical <laughs> claims by. I think you're okay so far. And you All haven't right. mentioned any names here. So, <laughs> okay. so, so he'll document their results, right. share them. Yep. And now he's off to the races in terms of having a business that he can scale. I, in the same way, I have uh, a student, her name is Sophie. Mm -hmm. uh, she lives in Australia mm -hmm. and she has a, a little company called Seed and Sprout. And mm -hmm. Seed and Sprout sells environmentally friendly kitchenware. Right. So, so that would be, a, she has a reusable containers that are, are made of uh, like aluminum and, or 
She has uh, reusable bags that she sells. Mm -hmm. And she w developed her first prototype. She ran a Kickstarter, posted it on her personal Facebook page, said, here's what I'm up to in the world. This is my prototype. I want to I wanna take this bigger. Can you help? Mm -hmm. Her first product was this lunchbox that she sold. Mm -hmm. And she did $25,000 in pre-orders. Nice. Just She did three things well. She posted about it on her personal Facebook page. Mm -hmm. She went to 10 personal friends who were passionate about the topic and mm -hmm. said, can you please talk about this on my behalf? Mm -hmm. And she went to a couple Facebook groups, so like influential type of Facebook groups that right. were like 10,000 people. Right. And they said, this is what I'm up to. I'm running a Kickstarter. Can you help? And one of them said yes. And that cumulative effect from all of those different touch points created $25,000 in pre-orders for a lunchbox. Wow. That, that's enough. That's enough to get the ball rolling. Right. So that's that's the first thing that you should be investing in mm -hmm. if you want to have a side thing. Right. From there, right. I think you should be investing 10% of your take-home pay into long-term wealth building assets that you never touch. What's an example of that? Yeah, so for me, my favorite is dividend paying stock, mm -hmm. which is super unsexy and boring. Right. But I love dividend paying stock because they have a double compounding effect. Mm -hmm. A double compounding effect is some stocks, we call them dividend aristocrats. Mm -hmm. To give that give that a Google. Mm -hmm. uh, that is a term that refers to companies that raise their dividend every year for at least 25 years. Mm -hmm. A dividend aristocrat. Mm -hmm. And so if we look at a company that has raised their dividend every year, consistently and predictably, mm -hmm. there's a compounding effect that happens to that. Because year one, you're getting a dollar. Right. Year two, you're getting a dollar twenty. Year mm -hmm. three, you're getting a dollar forty. A dollar right. sixty, eighty, two dollars, forever and ever, amen, hopefully. Mm -hmm. And so we have a compounding effect that's happening from the raise of the dividend. Mm -hmm. But I reinvest my dividends into more stock. Right. So that creates a second compounding effect effect. Mm -hmm. So we're buying more stock, which is giving us more dividends, which is buying more stock, which is buying more dividends. Mm -hmm. And so we have a snowball that starts to roll. Compounded over 30 years, mm -hmm. I'm yet to see any investment on the stock market outpull those numbers right. because you get two compounding effects compounding against one another. Right. So if someone can show me a better strategy, I would love to see it. I've had this debate with a bunch of financial planners mm -hmm. and my numbers always check out right. of dividend, long-term dividend paying stock outperforming just about anything else in the stock market mm -hmm. specifically. Now, with that 10% going to that, the next thing that I do, and again, I'm not recommending any financial advice, but what I do is I take my profits mm -hmm. at the end of the quarter mm -hmm. or the end of the year and I'm buying cash flowing assets. Mm -hmm. A cash flowing asset to me is real estate or real estate syndications or real estate investment trusts. Mm -hmm. It is, I buy web businesses. Mm -hmm. My favorite is websites because mm -hmm. a website that profits $1,000 a month almost passively with a few hours a month of maintenance mm -hmm can be sold for twenty to twenty-five thousand mm. dollars. That's a pretty good deal for somebody who's just looking for an extra thousand dollars a month. Mm. And there are some interesting tax suggestions that some CPAs will look at and analyze. CPAs, I've talked to several that disagree with one another, mm -hmm. but I've heard some very interesting proposals on how you could classify websites as an asset mm -hmm. to be more tax efficient, mm -hmm. similar to real estate. Yeah. Real estate, you get certain write-offs. Right. Uh, web properties and web businesses have some similar types of classification, so it mm -hmm. could be very tax efficient income. Mm -hmm. This would be investing in someone else's business. Mm -hmm. right? We're looking for a way to passively be involved in something that is producing cash flow for us. So I like real estate investment trusts, which are publicly traded real estate companies because mm -hmm. they pay really high dividends. Mm -hmm. I like websites mm -hmm. because the ROI is just absolutely absurd mm -hmm. and they're a sellable asset and I like investing in businesses. So the first thing is that long-term thing I'm never gonna touch. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is I've now got savings mm -hmm. and I'm gonna take that savings and I'm gonna try and buy more income mm -hmm. with that but I'm only doing that every quarter mm -hmm. or at the end of every year when I have my profits left over from my business. Right. The, is there certain um, investments that you look at that maybe you'd say, if I were to look at somebody who was 
a millennial versus someone who's uh, you know a Gen Xer versus someone who's a baby boomer, like uh, yeah, depending on the phase of life that you're in, are there certain um, buckets that they that they would fit into relative to the type of investments they should be looking at? Yeah, I, I think when we're looking at investing, mm -hmm. we we would prefer that whatever we're investing in, we have some sort of a strategic advantage in. Mm -hmm. And that would could be knowledge, mm -hmm. it could be skill set, it could be people that we know. Right. And millennials, stereotypically, are pretty good with social media. Mm -hmm. So they're gonna they're going to have an insight into what emerging platforms mm -hmm. we should pay attention to. So it might be as practical as there's a there's a, a social media site right now called Twitch, mm -hmm. which is emerging and capturing a lot of market share. Yeah, my son's on it. Okay, <laughs> there you go. So so if you have a young person mm -hmm. who is on the cutting edge of that trend, have them double down on that because they have a strategic advantage mm -hmm. over someone who is in an older generation. Right. So it's gonna take you and me mm -hmm. a little bit longer to figure out a brand new social platform than either of our children. Right and they're gonna have a little bit of a strategic advantage there, have them go all in on that. Mm -hmm. Whereas somebody who is older has the benefit of time and experience. Mm -hmm. We've seen market cycles, mm -hmm. we've seen ups and downs. Whereas right now millennials have lived through only boom times right. in the last 15 years. Yeah. So what is gonna happen when the market has its next pullback? They're probably gonna freak out, they're going to overcorrect, oversell, they're going to run for security because they've never had to see it before. Right. But if you're an older person and you've seen ups and downs and you've got some in the bank and you're good, that's a good time to have dry powder to be able to buy up assets. They're gonna be incredibly undervalued mm -hmm. when we have the next pullback. So where do you have a strategic advantage? Do you have relationships that you can bring to a new investment? So for example, I privately only invest in physical products brands. And the reason for that is because I've made all of my money in physical products brands. Mm -hmm. I have connections to people in retail. Mm -hmm. I have connections to influencers who can help incubate a company. I have access to investors who know that that's my skill set and they're throwing money at me. Mm -hmm. It would be really silly for me to try and pick the next cryptocurrency because right. I have no strategic advantage there. Right. Now, I have invested in cryptocurrency, as we've discussed, mm -hmm. partially to keep myself sharp, even though I don't believe in it as a as a, a, an asset sector, mm -hmm. except for one exception. Mm -hmm. I did invest in one emerging ICO, mm -hmm. one cryptocurrency, that was brought to me by a personal friend of mine mm -hmm. who, as far as I know, is the most connected person in the cryptocurrency space, and he specializes and ICOs and raising money for ones that he personally backs, that he mm -hmm. personally invests in, that he personally vets the team and says, these are guys that I believe in. Mm -hmm. Now, I am not betting on that cryptocurrency. I'm betting on a relationship. Right. In the same way, I have investors who invest in me because they're investing in my knowledge and my strategic advantage. So we've all got some sort of strategic advantage, mm -hmm. either with people we know, with assets we have, with connections or experience or time. And I would say, depending on what those are, and that's going to largely be determined by your age and experience, that's where you should start looking at where you should invest. To that point, um, when, when you're doing capital raises, I mean, when I was out uh, raising money for one of our ventures, uh, and I'd get in front of the, you know, the private equity guys, I asked them all the same question, which was, what's the number one thing you look for in an investment? And 100% of, the of the time they said, the team, it's the who. Yeah. Not, is this a great idea? Of course they have to like the idea, but it's who the person is or who the team is that's gonna bring this into reality. So I think you're making a really, really good point here. I like to say that the answer to almost everything is who. Yeah. I mean, even if we think about experiences that made us happy, mm -hmm. usually we're thinking about who it was with. Right. You can be in the most beautiful place in the world and be around people you don't like and it's not a good experience. Right. Whereas you could be in a small, tiny, rundown dorm room mm -hmm. and have the best time ever because right. you're with your best friends. Right. And almost everything comes down to who. Success comes down to who. Investments come down to who. Happiness, love, they all come down to who. Not what, not how. Those things can be helpful. Yeah. When can right. be helpful. 
but who is ultimately the determining factor. Yeah, and you talk about the arc of experiencing cycles, et cetera. I could tell you when I look back and say, okay, what mistakes did I make over the years, more to the point of the who, was taking opportunity over values. I'd, I'd, I'd look at you know certain people I want to put money into or, or create a partnership with, and, uh, and it was such a great opportunity, but there wasn't a values match between us. And even the product is a values match. In other words, are you investing in something that's contradictory to your own mm -hmm. values? That also can, can lead to some kind of a problem for you. So uh, that, I think that's really wise uh, investing advice for people that are out there. And I have almost the exact same experience. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's not fun and you, know, you want to learn after a while so you don't repeat that one. <laughs> so uh, in your experience, what is the timeline expectation or range of timelines to go from I'm starting to getting a thousand people to buy. 90 days. You said that so quickly that there's there's more of a formula here than, than I might understand. Well, so it, it's, it. it's just experience based on if you're really in it and mm -hmm. going for it, mm -hmm. it'll probably take you 30 days to have a message hit. Mm -hmm. One piece of content that impacts enough people, assuming that you are then gonna ride that and interact with all of the feedback that comes from that. Mm -hmm. So if you put out a different message, mm -hmm. a different tip, a different strategy, a different piece of advice, a different video, mm -hmm. one of them usually stands out and creates 80% of that audience. Mm -hmm. It's then your job to spend the next 60 days to take that message to as many people as possible. So if I look at all the videos that I've created, mm -hmm. I could point to less than 10 mm -hmm. that have probably attracted 80% of the business, 80% of the eyeballs, 80% of the attention, 80% of the PR that I've received over the last 10 years as an entrepreneur. I could also pick out five podcasts, five blog posts, mm -hmm. five Facebook posts. And what I'll do is when I see something hit, when I know I've got something, if something gets more shares, more likes, more emails, or even better people mm -hmm. responding, my ideal people to work with responding to it, mm -hmm. I then take that post and I turn it into a video. Mm -hmm. I then turn that video and we turn it into a blog post. We then turn that blog post, we turn it into a podcast. Mm -hmm. That same message is gonna be distributed to as many people as possible. And what will happen at that point is then we can take that message and roll it out to other podcasts, mm -hmm. other YouTube channels, other blogs. So just today, uh, this morning, one of my mentors who has uh, a huge audience mm -hmm. noticed that I had tipped my cap to him mm -hmm. in one of my videos mm -hmm. and I shared on video a lesson that he had taught me mm -hmm. and he shared that with his audience, right? And so someone else saw that and they clicked the share button mm -hmm. and someone saw that and they clicked the share button. Or one time I had a Facebook post go semi-viral, probably got a hundred shares on mm -hmm. Facebook or so. and the people who were sharing it were not the people who would usually share my content. Mm -hmm. They were much higher level individuals. So mm -hmm. I was connecting with a really, really good market. So we turned that into a video. It was the most viral video I've ever done. Wow. We then took that and we turned it into a podcast, released mm -hmm. it on a podcast. And what I noticed was that several other podcasts bigger than mine who had started tuning into my podcast based on one of the other pieces of content I had put out they took the podcast episode, sent me a message, said, could we share this on our podcast? Mm -hmm. And so that one message, which was a six minute message, started building my audience, doing it one time to many, many people. So a lot of, a lot of new entrepreneurs will assume that building an audience mm -hmm. comes down to putting out as much as possible. And that's true mm -hmm. until you find your points that are connecting then you go scale those with more media. Mm -hmm. You go scale those with more relationships. You scale that by distributing it as much as possible. A thousand people happens as a result in 90 days. So if you're somebody that says, well, geez, I, I uh, you know, don't know how to put up all this stuff and to, to you know, get it implemented, I have something to say, but I don't know how to set up a blog. I'm not sure how to go and then market don't. So if you can't do it yourself, what should you do? Either figure it out, mm -hmm or choose something that you do understand. Okay. And if, like, if you're not willing to figure it out, just don't do it. Mm -hmm. Like seriously, just don't do it. Your message isn't important enough for you. You should pursue another route. Right. You should go be an investor or you should start a business that you do understand. So you have to understand enough to be able to evaluate those results. Otherwise you're just wasting money and you probably, whatever you're thinking about doing probably isn't that important to you. So now we're talking about content. You know, my other question was, I have content, but 
I don't know how to program a page. I don't know how to set up opt-ins. I don't know how to, you know, what, what list management do I use, et cetera. You know, these are a lot of just the fundamentals that people really need to understand. Your advice is go to work and study it and figure it out and then go once you do or don't bother. Now you're saying, okay, well, I'm trying to figure out content. You said just open up your phone. So where were you going with that particular idea? So once again, we're talking about building audiences, right? And I think building audiences is a superpower to have that first side thing that produces thousands of dollars a month or mm -hmm. your first million dollars or gives you the acceleration point to sell a product. Right. And so that's the context with her talking. I don't think it's 100% necessary mm -hmm. that everybody is producing videos on the internet. Mm -hmm. um, I don't even think it's necessary per se to do this in order to build a business. Mm -hmm. I do think it's necessary for there to be some sort of audience in order to make any product hit. Mm -hmm. Now it doesn't have to be you being the face of it. It could be videos that someone else makes and you're testing different messages. Mm -hmm. It could even be just sponsoring other people's audiences. Mm -hmm. For example, if you didn't want your company or you as a person to do any content distribution at all, just go pay the people who are doing it to adjust their message to talk about you. Right. And that's called influencer marketing. Mm -hmm. And the ROI on that is absurd when done well and very poor when done poorly. But if you have people who are aligned with your values, your mission and your products, it can be very, very lucrative in a way to put a business or a message or product on the map. Mm -hmm. Now, if you are gonna be that person that is distributing a message, mm -hmm. it's your job to experiment with what messages hit. And everybody hates it at the beginning, mm -hmm. everybody. I'll tell you a quick story. I was, uh, I was on a plane preparing to give a keynote mm -hmm. and I opened up my laptop to work on the keynote and my internal noise said, man, who wants to listen to me talk about business and entrepreneurship? Mm -hmm. And I was talking about what we're talking about right now and I felt like I had nothing to add to mm -hmm. this crowd. And all of a sudden my internal noise started to come in. Mm -hmm. And so I said, okay, well that's interesting. I guess I'll start with that. And so I went on stage and I said, I opened up my laptop to share this with you and I felt like I had nothing to share because we are all battling this internal voice in our head that says we're not good enough, that mm -hmm. says we have nothing to share. Right. And I just want you to know that it's easy for you to sit in the crowd and look at the people on stage like they have some sort of special ability, and mm -hmm. I don't. Mm -hmm. I'm just a normal guy who figured out a few habits that created some success for me. And at no point do I want you to put me on a pedestal just because I'm a few feet above you mm -hmm. and I'm delivering this because I feel like I'm one of you and I've been sitting in this in the, in the crowd many times, idolizing the people on stage, not knowing that they had their insecurities too. Mm. So you're gonna feel that come up when I'm sharing what worked for me. And I want you to know that you're just as good as me. Mm. I'm just maybe a year ahead mm. in terms of my skill set. With that, let's start going. Yeah. And it was the most, it was the best part, the most well-received part of the entire keynote. It was because all of a sudden, it was a feeling that we gave to them of a freedom and an ease around permission of feeling uh, inadequate. Mm -hmm. And when I just connected in that way and shared what was exactly on my mind, uh, that connected with the rest of the audience. So it's not your job to figure out what to say. Mm -hmm. It's your job to share what is true for you and what you've learned over your years of being in whatever field you're in and seeing what connects. And every time I try to figure it out here, mm -hmm. it sucks. Yeah. And every time I just, deeply connect and share something that's meaningful, there are other people for whom it's meaningful too. Yeah, well, I think there's a lot of people that have this sort of secret identity, especially people who are on the <laughs> platforms, right? And that's what you basically took the mask off and let them see, you know, what's real. But uh, when I'm advising entrepreneurs, I basically tell them, you know, the, the characterization I use based on the presentation I do is called, you gotta find your Miles Davis. In other words, it's what's most purely you inside and let that out. Uh, and, and be vulnerable in that process because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the people who are the right people to be attracted to you are right. going to bond with you for the right reasons. Right. Yeah, I think a lot of individuals are being something that they're not mm -hmm. in order to impress people that they don't want to hang out with anyway. Right, right. <laughs> and and I played that game before and I, I did not find it enjoyable. And at mm -hmm. some point you say, what do I really want my life to be like? Because it co does come down to who. Yeah. Who do I really want to spend my time with? And yeah. if I got $10 million or I got $100 million, would I want to spend time with these people? And if the answer is no, 
we might need to make some adjustments on our life decisions. No question. And you are who you hang out with, you know? So who are you around? And that's, that's really right. what you're aspiring to. I remember uh, some years ago, I had done some programs with Deepak Chopra. And, uh, and one of the things he said to me that I just thought was, was uh, kind of profound in the realm of what you're saying is that he said, we, we, buy, uh, we buy things we don't want with money we don't have to impress people we don't like. <laughs> right. And it's funny because of how true it really, really was. So uh, that, that's a, uh, I, I love that you got up on a platform and basically just had no mask on and just said, here's who I am and here's what we're going to talk about. I think often we're looking for where the strategy of the formula is that'll create a certain result. And so we become a reflection of what we think will produce a certain result. Mm -hmm. And what I've discovered is that I've got a monopoly mm -hmm. on one thing, mm -hmm. and it's being Ryan Daniel Moran. Mm -hmm. And I'm the best in the world at being Ryan Daniel Moran. I suck at a lot of things, mm -hmm. but I'm really good, the best in the world at being Ryan Daniel Moran. It also happens to be when I'm happiest. Yeah. And so the more that I can be myself, and apologetically so, the happier I am, and the more I attract people that I want to work with, which allows me to charge higher prices, mm -hmm. and which allows me to be more in my zone of genius, which allows me to give better results for my clients and my customers, mm -hmm. which allows me to spread a message deeper and wider, and allows me to charge higher speaking fees. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, I make more money the more true I am and the more honest I am to myself and to other people. So if nothing else, I got a monopoly on being myself. <laughs> and we all do. You're the best in the world at it. So the more you can be that, the more money you end up making. So you were earlier talking about a blueprint um, and saying, you know, there was kind of like, I think, kind of the stage one of the blueprint. Is there some additional dimensions to that you can share? Yeah, so when we've got some sort of a distribution method, and that would be a thousand people following us, mm -hmm. it might be the ability to put a product on Amazon.com mm -hmm. because now with Amazon's distribution centers, literally anybody can have a seller account on Amazon. Mm -hmm. You can Google Amazon FBA account. Mm -hmm. You can set one up for like 40 bucks, mm -hmm. and you can sell products on Amazon.com. Mm -hmm. uh, you could have a email list that is responsive, which means you can sell physical products or webinars or consulting. It, once you have the distribution mechanism, it takes three to five products mm -hmm. selling 30 units a day at a $30 price point mm -hmm. to have about a million dollar business. So that's the, the first stage of it is having the one product mm -hmm. that you release to enough customers where you say, I think I might have something here. Mm -hmm. And that just requires you asking your audience, would you want something? Just like my doctor friend, who said, I'm thinking about doing this. I need 100 people to fund the whole thing. Would anybody want it? Mm -hmm. And he had 100 people say yes. And so he didn't go to a manufacturer and develop this whole big wonky wonk system. He said, would anybody want it? All right, are you willing to pay for it? Mm -hmm. And they paid for it. Right. And as a result, he was able to fund the development of that business. And that's win then play rather than spend a bunch of money and right. find out if you got something. Right, right. Yeah. and you can get your mistakes out of the way. Yeah with people who wanted to be first in line. Right. So that's step one. That mm -hmm. is like stage 1A. Mm -hmm. And then when you have something, it's regularly distributing it to the rest of the audience. Mm -hmm. You had 100 people go through it. Now can we release it to more people? Mm -hmm. And when that snowball starts to roll, we can roll out product number two, mm -hmm. product number three, and on and on until we have a million dollar business mm -hmm. or more. Mm -hmm. When we have a few products working, it's our job to start going out to other audiences. Mm -hmm. And that's when people know you enough for you to be able to have some sort of authority to get on other people's podcasts, right. for you to be communicating to other blogs and on other YouTube channels. That's when influencers start to pick you up. It's when you bring on other team members who have other skill sets. Mm -hmm. And that's when you can really start to scale something beyond a million if that's what you want to do. Really interesting. For me, the way that you've organized this in your thinking and presentation is demystifying a lot of it and also putting it into bite-sized chews, right? So that it's like, this is the chunk, you get to this level, yes. then this is the next one. And, and you're also, I think, mitigating risk because you're not spending 
a ton of time and money until there's certain milestones that right. are checked off. So it looks like far side simplicity. You know, it seems simple now, but there had to be a complexity arc and a lot of learning to get you there, I'm assuming. Well, what I, I think this does is it gives people permission to get started. Yeah. Because it removes all of the heaviness and the risk around trying to eat the whole elephant in one bite. Right. And if we realize that we can test things before we get too involved, that gives us permission to say, all right, I'll experiment. Mm -hmm. And we realize that the downside when we're just playing for a while is very low. Whereas most people, and I, I'd say 80% of my work with entrepreneurs is getting them to stop overthinking it. Right. And that is that they're here, they want to go here, and they say, how do I, how do I get here? Right. And what I tell them is, we got, we got, we got to get to the first step. Mm -hmm. like that, that's what we have. This is the only thing we need. We cannot get here without getting here first. Mm -hmm. And so what all I need to do is get them to take that first step. And right. then the second step and the third step. Whereas most people think about the marathon the whole time. And we can run a marathon, sure. but we can't run a marathon without taking the first step. And so when we distill down what it would take to get some skin in the game, all of a sudden it doesn't seem so scary. Any other considerations uh, for people who are looking to create side hustle? You know, they, they basically say, uh, I've got a decent career, I want to create more, um, I'm willing to you know, give time, money, energy to be able to create something more. Any other cases about people who've done this that you think might be valuable or other ideas uh, beyond what you've already stated that might? Well, one, one thing that I'll say is mm -hmm. I would not recommend getting into anything unless you are willing to commit to it for a year. Mm -hmm. I take a rule that I don't evaluate any result until I've been into something for a year. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's simply putting out enough videos mm -hmm. knowing I want to see what will hit, but I won't know for a year. Mm -hmm. And I might test doing 30 videos over 30 days mm -hmm and decide I don't enjoy it, right. but I still won't evaluate the result until I've had a year to see if one of them caught on. Right. And I have had that happen where a video was a dud, mm -hmm. and then six months later, someone picked it up and it became a viral sensation. I have had that happen, uh -huh. and, and we won't know that for a year. I've had that happen in, with podcasts, I've had it happen with products, where you were too early on a product, and then a year later, all these customers flooded in. Right. So. I, I'm not saying you have to work at something for a year, right? But we have to wait at least a year to be able to evaluate any result as possible at, at 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 all. So if you're not willing to wait a year for the result, you probably don't want to be in that thing, mm -hmm. and that allows us to say no to a lot of things that we probably won't enjoy doing. And so if you're if you're willing to wait a year, then we can backtrack. Okay, what are we going to enjoy doing for the next year, mm -hmm. or how can we orchestrate our lives? so that we're in a position to enjoy it for the next year while we evaluate the result. Well, there's a ton of wisdom in that because I think that's another thing when you're coming to this new, uh, what, is, what expectations should I have? You know, yeah. so many of the things that are sold out there to teach you how to do this, it's like, you know, uh, lack of a better phrase, you know, get rich quick or, you know, overnight results, et cetera, testimonials. But really there has to be some sort of a timeline. And, and one of the things talk about, you know, a lot of experience, uh, perseverance used to be one of my core values. So on the other side of that equation, now I say perseverance is a virtue until it isn't. Mm. You know, I have sunk millions of dollars into ventures over a period of protracted time pushing a rock up the hill because I don't give up, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm like, after I've done that a couple of times, I'm realizing how do, now, my, now my value is how do I fail fast? How do I find yes. out as compared to torture myself for a long period of time? Yes. So on the one side, you're saying you, you can't really measure results for a year, which I think is really good wisdom. And then the other side, at what point do you find out maybe you know, this is not the, the right message or the right uh, message to market match? When you stop enjoying it. Uh, I have, I have a, a mentor named Travis mm -hmm. who reminds me to ask myself the question, what would I be doing even if I was failing my ass off? Mm -hmm. I heard, I heard the story once of uh, Jerry Seinfeld, who is either a billionaire or close to being a billionaire. Right. A comedian that's a billionaire, <laughs> that, that doesn't happen. Right. He says that when he first started, if he could just pay for dinner based on what he made from comedy, that was like amazing to him. Mm -hmm. And it made me think, what's that thing that I'd be stoked mm -hmm. if I just got enough to pay for dinner? Right. And I, again, I don't have that thing. I don't have that passion. I'm more of a feeling I pursue. Mm. 
I have I have a, a a way of life that I like to pursue. I have I pursue excitement. Mm-hmm. So how do I get paid to live in that place? Right. And so what that requires me to do is anything that doesn't move me closer to that, I say no to. Mm-hmm. And I and I went to my team recently and I said, all right, the one thing in our business, if it's built around me, if it requires me, then. I've got to be pursuing excitement. So right. from now forward, the primary question, if we're going to pursue anything new is, does this make me excited or does this not make me excited? Mm-hmm. And if it does, we'll say yes to it. And if it, if we go, well, it will make a lot of money and money's exciting. Mm-hmm. No, because I know I'm going to burn out on that. Right. It doesn't mean it's not a good financial move in the short run. Mm-hmm. It just means that I'm going to end up burning out, which means I'm probably not going to create what I want to create to get the result that I want evaluating a year back. Mm-hmm. There's two things that I learned early in life from my Uncle Tom that he shared with me that became very good business and investing advice. The first was spend your money on things that people can't take away from you. Mm-hmm. At the time, I was learning guitar, mm-hmm. and he said they can take your guitar, but they can't turn your they can't take away your knowledge of how to play guitar. Right. And experiences, connections, relationships, these are all things that no one can take away from you. Mm -hmm. And when you're starting as an entrepreneur, when you're starting a new business, when you're going a new direction in life, spend your time and your money on things that people can't take away from you. We have to have some sort of a skill set. We have to have some sort of value that we're creating in the world. Mm -hmm. So when you're a new entrepreneur, Mm -hmm. when 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 you're new to the game, when you're pursuing a new life, the first thing is to invest in things that people can't take away from you. Mm-hmm. That's skill sets, it's education, it's relationships, and those are the things that are going to have the highest ROI in your business mm-hmm. when you are first starting out. And then the other thing that Uncle Tom taught me was, as an investor, the thing that I look for and he was looking for and passed on to me was 1% per month. Mm-hmm. That's our target range for a profitable investment. Mm. We're not looking for home runs, we're looking for lots and lots of singles and doubles, 1% per month. If that's a $100,000 investment, it means I want to be making at least $1,000 a month from that $100,000. And if I can't get that at some point in the future, Mm -hmm. I'm going to wait for the right opportunity where I will be able to get that. If what I'm looking for is cash flow, then 1% per month is my target. That's where I evaluate my deals. So all great wisdom uh, and uh, I think very uh, actionable, you know, as far as uh, what you're communicating here. It's not just abstract, it's really actionable stuff. Uh, So I really appreciate you sharing this with me. Any final thoughts in these realms before we tie up? Ultimately, we don't get rich trading our our hours for dollars. We get rich producing value in the marketplace. It's why capitalism is the most beautiful system in the world. It's the only system through which we're actually compensated for the value that we bring. Mm -hmm. And I'm so saddened by the mindset of waiting for somebody else to tell us what we're worth in the form of minimum wage Mm -hmm. um, or hoping that somebody else does something in order to help us get ahead. If you want to get ahead, you bring new value to the marketplace. Mm -hmm. You learn new skills. You develop new relationships. And you bring those to the company that you work in or to customers and clients who are willing to pay you more than what you're getting at your job. It is always about what other people are willing to pay. And something that has really helped me recently is shifting from thinking about what can I get out of this to how can I create and how can I give. And not only how can I give, but who can I give to? Because sometimes the problem and the thing that's holding us back is not you and it's not your product, it's just the person that you're marketing it to. So an idea or a service, the same one can be worthless to one person and worth $10,000 a month to somebody else, same person. So sometimes just changing the person that you are speaking to Mm -hmm. is enough to go from failure to millionaire Mm -hmm. just because of who values it. Value is subjective, Mm -hmm. value is person to person. And when we're not getting the results that we want, it just means that we need to adjust our positioning in the marketplace, either what we're providing or who we're providing it to. And these things are always changeable. They're always hackable. None of it is stagnant. It's constantly changing. It forces us to be on our edge, be on our best, to be always moving forward and growing. And so this free society that we all want literally forces us to be better every day. 
Great stuff. Thanks for being such a great champion of capitalism. And, My pleasure. And sharing all this passion uh, with this audience. Uh, I, I really believe you delivered a lot of value today. So thank, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. To see the next episode in the Money Revealed series, check the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe, and I'll see you there. Let me just declare my bias right up front. I am a capitalist. I believe in capitalism. I think capitalism is the, collectively the greatest thing the humanity's ever created. It has completely changed the world.